did he make you take a bite of the heart like mine did? No, to keep it. <laughs> yeah, he acted like it was like a family tradition. He's like, oh yeah. He's like, every first year, it's tradition, you eat the heart. And then after, yeah, yeah, no, I did. And then afterwards, he's like, I can't believe you did that. He got it from like Red Dawn or something, a movie. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Heck yeah, man. Dude, we put a lot of food in the ground every year, you know, seemingly more and more, and uh, we have a ton of fun with it during the off season. Uh, there's some struggles that come with it too, though, right? Obviously, the back of my truck is evidence, you know, right now. It's mm-hmm. a couple of weeks after uh, I jackknifed, you know, a 4,800 pound uh, material spreader, you know, as I was coming down, and it's just it was too much weight for my truck there. But, you know, all those struggles aside, you know, dude, Deer Grill really has been a staple for our food plotting process uh, for several years now. Yes, we like to put lime and fertilizer on the plots, you know, if we can, but there are some that it's just we're not able to get to them or it's not feasible for us to get out of state with that stuff and so deer grow is kind of the, the quick and easy but still super effective option for us to be able to get the most out of those food plots that we can every year yeah, and i mean we're guilty of over analyzing things just like everyone else but that's the best part about deer grow is that it's going to create healthier soils which in turn makes better food plots and the fact is is we can simply spray plot start or plot till when we put the seed in the ground and then when that plant starts to grow we hit it with boost and we know that we walk away when we come back it's going to be a great looking food plot for anybody that's looking to try deer grow if you use the code hunter 15 that's h-u-n-t-r-1-5 at checkout for deergrow.com and save 15 percent on any of your deer grow products it's a great way to get started on this and just see what the results are for yourself better food plots bigger deer and we're back hey on our podcast episode 153 as nick continues to keep us in line Welcome, welcome. And as always, wherever you guys are listening, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Spotify, we appreciate you tuning in. Uh, give us a, a follow or a subscribe, whatever that, you know, button looks like on your end. Yeah, whatever it says. We appreciate it. And if you want to comment, we do skim those from, from time to time. So, um, you know, appreciate you being a part I would say of the Hunter than, family. Even more than skim. We probably read them. I'll read them. On occasion. Read them from time to time. On occasion, we read them. If it's long, I, sorry, I don't. Yeah. My attention I, span is not there. Uh, my, do you have a hint of dyslexia? For sure. I, mm. I definitely Interesting. do. Interesting. Do you read things bottom to top? No. Because <laughs> I do. <laughs> I must pass out you just saying that. And I get most of it. Yeah. For what, I'll start. I'll read the first sentence, then I jump to the bottom and skim oh, it wow. backwards up. And then I'm like, I get the gist. Yeah, I get it. I'm like, this dude this doesn't like us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, some of them will start off harsh, but then at the end, it's like, keep doing what you're doing. I'm like, oh. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. All right. I'm trying to get, that's more, it's the, I, I am trying to just get positive. to the point. Yeah, what is the point? Yeah. What's the point? Do you like us or not? <laughs> yeah, well, and not just that. It's like, are you asking a question? Or are you, I mean, dude, there's so many. Like, it's it's hard to keep up, you know? It's fun. It's, yeah. We do pay attention to them. Yeah. 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 So don't be offended. <clears throat> Not on TikTok. If you're commenting on TikTok, we don't see those. There's way too many there. YouTube, though. That's that's like the, those yep. were real. <laughs> TikTok's not real. Yeah, they're real. Also, if you're sending us messages on TikTok, we for sure don't read those. Oh, I was trying to figure out how to even access those the other day. I saw them the other day. I was like, there was a bunch of them. I'm like, ugh. Because we reply usually on in- Instagram. Yeah. But not on I TikTok. would like to, if there's a way to, because it. All I see is notifications, and you should follow this and that. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't know how to get to messages on TikTok. It's like buried. <laughs> yeah, buried in there. Nobody in de- the can, teach, can teach me, Nick. I could teach you. He knows how. Thanks. Yeah. Nick knows. Anyways, uh, October 12th, still. Yep. But if you're listening to this, I don't know, 20 something? 24th, I believe. Oh, it's a good day. It's a good day to be in a tree stand. Yeah. Tuesday. Yep. Tuesday the week was, before Halloween. Tuesday the twenty fourth. Oof. Yeah, that's a good day to be in a stand. Mm-hmm. Killed that buck on the twenty fourth. Mm-hmm. We're not in the weather forecast on that day yet. We so we don't know. But some, some rain before. I assume typically man, it's just nice nice it. rolling fronts here so far this year, though. I, I hope we'll continue to get those. Yeah. It'll um it's the only thing like I think we talked last podcast makes me a little nervous is we've had such great weather here to to kind of kick off October. Um, you know, it's where things are going to shut down and, you know, it's going to get hot and dry again or whatever. We're still kind of dry, though. Well, we're going to get pounded Saturday. Yeah. I got an inch. inch. I got an inch coming. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Have you seen that? Speaking of TikTok, it's like when, when you get the first inch in and it's like, oh, we're halfway there. <laughs> Uh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, relatable, right? Yeah, <laughs> mm-hmm. that's some nice good. Content. I get it. <laughs> yeah, relatable. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of what the weather patterns hold. Um, in fact, 
before our, our guest came on, uh, case of point, Jeff Sturgis and Jen Buchner are on today uh, for our podcast. Buchner or Buckner? Buckner. No, you keep saying Buckner, oh. and that keeps throwing me off. Buckner. Yes. Uh, on the podcast today, I was watching uh, one of Jeff's <laughs> videos recently, just kind of capping and highlighting October. And, you know, there's frankly just a lot of factors in October that, you know, could was it, make was it, it happen. The why you're hunting socks video? No. That's what's on his board right now. That'll be interesting to hear about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. No, this was basically, you know, how to hunt October, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, factors that would affect it, you know, and um, a lot of it still circles back. And this is, get Jeff's opinion on this, is around, you know, the food aspect of things, not just on acorns, but in terms of having, you know, green food plots or, um, you know, standing grain here probably towards the end of the month. But um, it, I think it's really interesting because, all of our farms probably were in the same kind of dry cycle there. Uh, oh, you know, bad. Kentucky, yeah, that was bad. That's what you call it, drought. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was... But what's what's interesting is, like, my my Kentucky plots look great. Like, not not that touch, not that mode. And yet, like, you got brassica plots, like, up at your farm or mine here in Pennsylvania, mode uh, because of water content. I don't know if it's just because... Combination. Yeah, combination of getting mode because of lack of of precipitation but yeah. also lack of precipitation itself that they yeah. were struggling. also mine went in two weeks later than yours. yeah that's right which I, is probably about the same time my pennsylvania to run that by jeff yeah total. my pennsylvania total. one went in about the same time you planted the fifth is when i planted them yeah August. that's about right <clears throat> yeah so yeah i mean lots of things uh also coincidentally a lot of rye jeff's gonna be excited to hear i put a lot of rye in this year yeah. a lot of cereal grains in general and we don't know like jared and i basically planted food plots end of july in illinois Mm -hmm. and like we don't know there's one camera we have a corner of the field and it's like the largest brassicas i've ever seen in my life they look right they're huge there's a there's a strong possibility that we get out there and it's it's there's only three or four brassicas <laughs> in the corner that the camera can see just because whatever <laughs> happened we broadcast into like five foot tall uh, just yeah. timing was not on our side there well nothing was really on our side and it was dry drought yeah it's just but you know we so we have some rye out there and but yeah, yeah. rhyme with some brassica. overall dude i mean i'm good i'm happy with the food plot success I, mm -hmm. I i'm i'm happy about getting back to clover as a staple mm -hmm. i may or may not consider and maybe jeff will have some input on this today uh uh putting some alfalfa into that you know mm -hmm. to combat some of these droughty conditions that we get mm -hmm. like in september and also the addition of cereal grains to complement or save uh some of our you know brassica brassica plots and stuff like that has been great i put i put uh oats into all of my clover plots this year yeah because it's their all first year clover first stands year. and the, the drought was like hitting them fairly good and so i was like what's it gonna hurt putting mm -hmm. these old bags of, of uh oats, yeah, out oats in them yeah it, i mean that drought it was across the board i mean most of us in this country felt that um you know i haven't heard as much here on the ehd side but i mean for a week or two there iowa was getting pounded yeah um, we even had some cases up in uh, northwestern Pennsylvania. I wonder where Jeff's at. Yeah, it's Wisconsin, right? They're getting pounded. No, maybe. Mm. But yeah, I mean, it it was uh, it was a pretty vicious cycle there. Um, you know, and it's probably not over yet. Maybe it's diminished, but because um, we did have that pretty cold uh, cold snap that came through. But yeah, just a lot of factors in this part of October into late October that could or could not make it happen. I. Yeah, the more that align, the better. But you know, one good cold front can you know make it happen. You know, and that's what it comes down to, I guess. Yeah, very nice. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> Not of approval from Nick. Appreciate it, Nick. <laughs> uh, anyway, and without further ado, yeah, let's bring in Jen and Jeff. <laughs> Hello. Hey guys, how you doing? Howdy, howdy, Jeff. Fuck thank that. you for uh, <laughs> bringing your better half onto the onto the show. Finally, right. The prettier half, mm -hmm. the prettier version. Yeah. Sturgis. I yeah. mean, his <laughs> basically has just kept you kept you out of the loop here for a couple podcasts, and then finally it was like, hey, we should probably have Jen on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Jared made a comment about your whiteboard behind you. Uh, I would assume that's a pretty important video. That was uh, just a motivational <laughs> little clip that I put on the board just you know uh -huh. <laughs> just for, for a talking point mm -hmm. and I think um it kind of brings us into an October there's a lot of hype going into October and there's a lot of deflated hunters I think you know by mid-October yeah and so 
um, as somebody who likes to help hunters and kind of maybe look at things a little bit differently than, uh, I thought it would be a good talking point. I know we always come into these conversations with nothing to talk about. I know. And Jeff, you well, usually have a whiteboard okay. full of talking points. So it's, like it's nothing, kind of the yeah, opposite. Nothing, not that we have nothing to talk about. There's no agenda. There's no script. There's no. <laughs> I, yeah. Frank, I've got a whole year's worth of like, since we talked to you last, a lot of the stuff we've implemented or put into action is like, we're reaping the rewards or, you know, if there's one case where we want a different direction, I'm interested to kind of catch you up on things that we've done. Words sure. of yours that we've heated and. But yeah. can we get, uh, Jen, can we get your background first? Everybody knows Jeff, right? But, but curious to your background growing up, like how you, how you even found yourself into, you know, hunting in, into the industry. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. I started hunting right, I mean, right when I could, when I was 12 in the state of Wisconsin, um, I would hunt with my dad before I got my, um, hunting license, like by myself. And so that was fun. I did that through high school. And then when I went to college, it kind of fell out of it. Um, I was really busy, really focusing on school. And then when I was done with college, kind of got back into it. And that's, I think when I really started to experiment with, uh, you know, different food plots and stuff like that. And I really enjoyed stuff. Water holes. Yeah. Water holes. I, the first water hole I ever put in, I I think it was like 150 gallon. I dug it by myself Whoa. and my dog. So <laughs> a little bit of paw help there. I gotcha. Yeah. That's going to be like the yeah. basis of your guys' relationship. <laughs> well, we, we met by a water hole. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I looked across the fence hole. and she was putting in a water hole. <laughs> yeah. Right. She actually has gutted just about every one of her deer that she shot, but she had to gut her first deer. Her dad would, you know, basically, here's a knife. Uh, mm -hmm. You do it. Yeah. And uh, so that was when you were 12, 13. Yeah, he made me, yeah, my first year, he was like, I'm not doing it. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, like, as a young kid, he's like, get your hand up there. And I'm like, <laughs> where? Yeah. <laughs> did he Did he make you take a bite of the heart like mine did? No, did he really? <laughs> yeah, he acted like it was like a family tradition. He's like, oh, yeah. He's like, every first year, it's tradition, you eat the heart. <laughs> And then after, that? yeah, yeah, no, I did. And then afterwards, he's like, I can't yeah. believe you did that. You got it from, like, Red Dawn or something, a movie. It is, uh, it is oh a family tradition gosh. now. Yeah, yeah. No I guess. I guess so. I'd have to have kids to carry on the tradition. That's great. I think the um, whether it's gutting and and now even like evolve. Like I I process most of my own deer. Like I think that from a skill level is it, it's pretty necessary. Like you know you don't see a lot of especially a lot of younger kids and stuff coming into that. You know it's easy to go to the processor, but the fact is is like we don't have deer processors or processors like we used to growing up like there, there used to be one almost in every town like you knew where to take it oh, now right. now it's it's not that popular anymore no it's like you you have to know them yep to even get your deer in oh, because yeah. they only take a certain number absolutely and, and if you don't get them into there you don't have a choice and one of Jen's goals for us here we really both want a walk-in cooler yeah, yeah. Uh, me too man because then we don't have to, like, say we're going to Pennsylvania to hunt public land the end of November. Well, if we shoot something here, we don't want to stay up all night processing it and then leave early the next morning at five in the morning to drive 14 hours and get out there. So we could, we get it by us a little bit of time. And she'd love to have stainless steel, you know, workbench facilities. Mm -hmm. cut up and, um, and it, and she always had, um, it was more of a, like friends and family tradition yeah where everyone gets mm -hmm. together and you butcher four or five and so we want oh, to that's cool that for, to where because we have people come over and use our pole building heck god uh, dylan he shot a mule deer out in south dakota a few days ago and he butchered it here on the way through and we were shooting videos anyways but it seems like we always have friends coming over using the pole building so yep. yeah um kind of make it more of an event would yeah. be fun because it is it's it's a fun time and that's yeah. what she's more used to too where we were more butchered on the tailgate of the truck because we had to get it done now and uh and uh throw it together but so jeff i'll have to i'll catch you after the podcast there's a company i talked to recently not exactly sure of the name i want to say it's called hunt shed or something anyways it's a really really nice portable walk-in cooler uh to the point where it's really? large enough that you could have stainless steel tables and stuff set up as well um nice. it, it almost oh. looks like um Oh, like a Western Kula tent? Buck? No, no, no. It's not like yeah. a little. Is that what that is? It's not a partner of your guys's, or had it been previously? Kula Buck? Is that, am I thinking of that right? 
Don't, yeah. don't You're thinking about the the like foil. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. No, this is like um, it's like, it looks like a western like tent basically, but it's it's built to be a walk-in cooler, mm -hmm. and then you can have your wow. tables and stuff set up at the front part of it. So you're not like working in the cooler, basically. What cools it? It's just a portable unit. Yeah, it's a portable unit. Yeah. Um, but they're big. I th I think it's like eight by ten or eight by nine or something like that. Like how portable? Like take it out of state with you, or yeah, like like break it down and take it out. Or if you have like a, you know, like if they want to set up on their house, or if I want to set up at like the Kentucky farm, I could leave it there for the season. It's pretty critical, man. On on t like you know, the a processing facility is is nice to have to start with. So that would be like at least a gambrel ideally yeah. like a pull a, barn. a wench like a, oh, yeah. a mechanic those are huge i still have the old pull-up one you want to scale there you want you want a uh you want a uh, we love our winch yeah oh. I bet. The pole building and that's why a lot of people come over because you can winch it right out of the back of the side by side yeah. that's up, huge. Put it right back in when you want to and then uh we have tarps that we spread on the floor and you can oh, cut wow. it up right there our our hunt winner tyler two years ago he shot his buck and so Jen and I kind of like said, Tyler, you just relax. And we sat and we, uh, we processed, processed it for him, just mm -hmm. hanging there. And there's some, that, you know, if, if it's hot or you're in a rush, like I get that, but I feel very therapeutic processing a deer, like taking my time and like, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. it just, I don't yeah. know, it's something that's kind of, I guess, primitive yeah. to the point of like, you know, I'm cutting this. I know what meat I'm cutting. I know what cuts oh, yeah. I'm making. Um, Definitely. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I really enjoy that. Like, usually it's at night, I've got my headlamp on, or if I got lights in the building going on, like, I don't know, radios, 90s countries it's, blaring it's a for fun, me. It's a fun know? hang, too. Like, on Brian's buck the other yeah. day, it was the next morning, he was processing it, and, you know, I was helping yeah. him skin it out, but the rest of them were just sitting around in office chairs and camp chairs, drinking beer, and then one sip of beer, one sip of coffee, you know, yeah. <laughs> back and forth, the early season cocktail. Yeah. Kind of like a church potluck casserole. It looks oh. really good, but you don't know whose hands have been in there, whose hair is sure. in there. Yeah. You don't know what ingredients are in there. It looks really good, but that's kind of like getting venison from someone else. Yeah. You know, I'd rather do it myself. You know exactly. Yeah. You know the pieces, even packaging. Absolutely. Package it from someone else. So we learned how to process deer back in the day because we didn't have the money. This was going back in the mid 80s. But we didn't have the money to take it somewhere and have it done by somebody. Yes. Else. So it's kind of like if you boys are going to shoot these deer, you're going to clean it. That's and how I gonna, learned. You're going to. Mm. No, they would be in the kitchen uh, wrapping and labeling. And yep. Where I, they didn't know my family, they weren't hunters at all. We were fishermen, so at least we had some fillet knives. But it was um, mm -hmm. it was That's more a, 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 a skill of uh, necessity. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, of, uh, I would. I would shoot you know, five to six does probably a year outside of Pittsburgh in like the urban areas and stuff. And like, yeah, it was like, whatever, 60, 70 bucks at that time to get a deer process. My dad's like, you're cutting them up. If you shoot them, you're cutting yeah, them up. Yeah. Yeah. And we didn't, we didn't get sausage sticks or jerky. No. For the people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, it was all basic cuts. Yeah. It's like, we want jerky. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Make it yourself. Yeah. Which yeah. Didn't happen. Yeah. No. And I'm just getting in because, I mean, it, it it's kind of a gradual like I used to do all basic cuts. And now um, so my youngest killed uh, an eight point on opening day here in Pennsylvania. And uh, so this, you know, I have everything's cut up and stuff. But this weekend we're going to do a bunch of deer sticks and stuff. So that'll be like our weekend project is, you know, making deer sticks and doing things like that. And, you know, he as long as they like he wants to take them to lunch at school and smoke stuff. Them? Yep. You so, smoker. yeah, I'll mix everything, cut it with some pork fat. I'll do a couple different types. Uh, I've got a, um, like a, a press for the sticks uh, or brats I'll do too. And then, yeah, all the sticks will go in a um, smoker. Nice. Yep. What kind of smoker you got? Oh, that's cool. Uh, yeah, that's really got one of those rec grills. It's a pellet grill. Just a grill, like a pellet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but just set it down on the low, low level for smoke. Oh, yeah. I guess mm -hmm. I have one of those too. It's at mm -hmm. home though. Yeah. It doesn't seem like you could do a whole lot on that uh, at a time, anyways. Yeah, ten pounds probably. How long does it take to like? How long are you smoking? The sticks stuff are are not long, a few hours, four hours. Hmm. But the the bigger stuff, like I'll probably do a couple summer sausage. Uh, that takes longer mm. to cook through. But I've done like, yeah, I'm yeah I did. Uh, I know, me too. I did um, <laughs> for the first time last year. I did uh, hot sausage links too, <laughs> and they were great. <laughs> So you got to cut it with yeah, pork or something because it's so lean, but yeah, 
um yeah it's that sounds good it's sounds fun sweet. we have uh it's wes's birthday today he's our you know our one full-time employee for the seed company other than jen <clears throat> and uh it's his birthday today so we're taking him out to lunch and this is sounding pretty good all this time. yeah see there you go we're, we're doing that right after this podcast we're there going, you go <laughs> Wes the lunch he's well deserving so we got to treat him wherever he wants to go so that's whatever's awesome. open at lunch it's hard to be good food in deer camp. I'm I'm fortunate that our deer camp is at my parents' house for the most part, and my mom is like, yeah, yeah, she's gotten pretty good over the years. She made us oh, dinner nice. a couple weeks every ago. night. Oh, we mm -hmm. come into it, but and it's a it's a blessing and a curse too. So like they're real involved in ministry and stuff. So there's there's always people at the house, like like just throughout October, November, just like oh, there's a group of pastors came in and oh, this youth group was here and they brought all this like you know brisket. One of them smoked. One of them did mac and cheese and stuff. And says so there's always. That's always, awesome. always good food, and the fridge is always stocked full of uh, of IPAs. Yeah, so. see, you're, you're in good shape. With those church, church potluck casseroles, then. Probably. Oh, more than familiar. <laughs> yeah, Jared's <laughs> Jared's put a few of those away in his time. What's probably. my mom makes something called a cowboy casserole? Yeah. It's just a giant. It's a giant it's skillet yeah. of you know, potatoes and eggs and all kinds of meat and stuff, and it's like, yeah, that with a couple yeah. beers before a nap after Take a morning sleep. hunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that'll, it's a, that'll you're putting right. me in there right now so so uh jeff and jen this is what do we say this is 21st uh, 24th Fourth. Yeah. okay so this podcast is going to drop october 24th so just for okay. frame of reference of what we're talking about and, and timing um we oh, had just yeah. yeah it's getting serious well that's what i was gonna say jared and i just kind of talked um earlier this morning about stuff and you know, this stretch of, let's just say the 24th to Halloween is probably one of my favorite times to chase a mature buck. Um, yes. Just because of the predictability, I think, still. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, we kind of look at it that, uh, I was just talking to someone this morning, um, uh, Ben Rising, you guys probably know him, but he shot a giant, giant. last week, 100 inch. And um, so I love talking to Ben. I've known him throughout the years, and I consider him probably you know one of the greatest whitetail hunters we have you know yeah. he's he's a lot of people don't realize he doesn't hunt on the same farm even in the same state even on just private land he hunts all over the place and when he hones in on a big one he goes right in and it's kind of like we were talking that it seems like the older a buck becomes the more rigid he is in his daylight home core area so he's a little bit easier to pattern but of course he's older so he's easier to spook too but boy, when you get into that last seven, 10 days of October, it's that buck that's local right now. Instead of, you know, when he's bedding, he could go over here to the neighbor's stand of oaks, over here to the neighbor's food plot, your food plot, this water hole. But it seems like when you get to that October 24th time and beyond, he doesn't just go to one of those, he goes to all three yeah, or all four. Like all of a sudden his movements turn parallel to field edges instead of just going out to a field. He... And so that's that time. And so that's why when I first hit the morning stands too, because they're not just going back to a bedding area and just sitting down and browsing within 20 feet. They're actually moving around 10 acres, five acres. They might be in a really small, tight area, but man, they become so much more predictable and killable during that time. And that's, I can't wait to hit a morning stand. Yeah. Right now, you know, on the 24th, well, I'll probably be, we'll have already both sat. Yeah. In the morning. I, I had daddy duty last night, so mm. I wouldn't pick up the axe and Jen was sitting in a tree on a water hole. We've been waiting to hunt, but uh, what we trade off a little bit here. Well, we had, I sat a morning once already with Corey. So Corey's got a, Corey's got a limited time frame. So, yeah. and I don't like pushing the issue if we, if we, you know, don't have to, but we had some bucks hitting, you know, there's this, it's, it's that same spot where that dude killed the, or Brian killed this buck here. And it's just like, man, it's, it's one of those spots that like it's, it's accessible via pasture and it just it's it's a perfect transition between bed and food and so we hunted that one morning had a good wind got in there we had hunted it the night before which you know yeah that's that's what kind of pulled us out of it the third time i'm like i don't know how many times we yeah. can hunt this safely but uh we yeah. saw i we saw a pile of deer i mean probably 12 does mm -hmm. i think and there was a lot a lot of morning activity i think a lot this because october cold fronts are you know there's a little bit of pseudo movement going on here i think it um oh, yeah. i think it's really kind of fascinating down to and it's the it's the subjective part of it right we talk about this kind of social behavior even down to the individual deer i hunted two yeah. mornings um last week in kentucky because this mature eight that i've been hunting he's been showing only in the mornings i don't see him at all in the evenings you know he's betting super close to where i'm hunting him 
uh, cause he's there at eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock in the morning. And then, yep. but I don't, he doesn't ever come through at like seven or eight at night. He, he doesn't make his round there. So, you know, whatever loop he's doing, he's finishing that loop, uh, in the morning. So yeah, I, you know, it's kind of, it comes down to that individual situation where normally I wouldn't be hunting those mornings, but that, that's the only way I was going to kill that deer if, or at least have a shot at it. Well, that's for predictability wise. Can you imagine when, uh, it gets into that 24th, 28th, you have a cold front night and I'm, that's when he comes there. You yep. have like 50% chance instead of like, maybe he's just not going that way right now, but boy, it really changes that last seven, 10 days, especially up here in the North part. And then it's kind of like Kansas, Southern Indiana, Southern Illinois, Kentucky. It seems like they're about a week later mm -hmm. uh, for that. And I call it the pre-rut, yeah. you know, that's, um, that's when I refer to it as anyways, that time period, but it seems like the pre-rut more South is more the end of October, you know, that Halloween time and then early November. Yeah. Jeff, what are you guys seeing for um, like fall transitions right now? I guess I'll kind of prelude that question with that buck that Brian shot transitioned from a spot that I know for a fact he was summering and I had pictures all summer long about a mile and a half away. And at the same time, uh, there, I, and I told him, I said, any minute here now, there's another buck that I think is going to show up just based on the fact that he was there last year, two and a half miles away. So, and, and he did that night. So within the past three or four days, we've had two, bu well, a week, I guess. Mm -hmm. I've had two bucks that I know were at least a mile and a half. One was two and a half miles away, move in to what I would call their, their fall ranges and, and kind of settle in. Are you guys seeing some of that? Yeah, we are. We, uh, in fact, in Wisconsin, we had one that, uh, boy, and unfortunately last year I missed him. He was six when he was four, I wounded him. So I have a little history and last oh, year, just a little history. Third time's a charm. Huh? Well, last year wasn't just missing him. I get, I get needles in my eyes. In fact, uh, that's next week, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, it's every six weeks. And so um, I had a, the first shot last year in November. I had a patch on my left eye. He came in. Sounds like a big excuse, but I couldn't see very well out of my left side. And I got lazy the whole time. My eye was burning. I kept hitting it with a tissue, pulling down the patch. Here comes a buck on my left side. I'd missed him the morning before. And I just got lazy thinking it was a smaller buck. And even though I'm sitting for that buck, and so I turned my right as he's walking by, and sure enough, it's him. I try to stand up, grab my bow, pull back, and he was already gone. Yeah. And I didn't have that window. And then the next morning, I sat like 100 yards away, and I spooked him. I got down out of the stand at 1030. I was thinking about sitting until 11. But anyways, I spooked him at like 1040. Mm. So I have a good history with him. He only comes on the property in October, November, December. He's around in January sometimes. And uh, he just came back last weekend which was awesome to see him. And he still, he likes betting on the neighbors, but then the neighbor I talked to a lot, they actually have like 500 acres. We only have 30 acres to hunt, but the neighbor hadn't seen him until that time too. And then another one moved in, literally the neighbor's getting a picture at, which it's cool to be able to talk to the neighbors, but they're getting a picture at like 725 and we're getting a picture of them at like 740 on our land where he betted all day. Yeah. So it was cool. I mean, those two are shooters and they moved in and they were the first two shooters that we saw on the property in Wisconsin and they finally moved in. So that was right now, this time of year. And then here we had a, the flyer buck. We don't even have a name for yeah. him. He just moved in. Uh, we just noticed him. And then we noticed some jostling around. It's kind of funny, like, because our property is sprawling here in Minnesota. It's 255 acres from one corner to the other. It's like 1.1 miles. There's all kinds of over three miles of field edge. And you'll have uh, a buck bow that's on the northeast corner all summer. And then he's in the center of the property all hunting season, hmm. even, even all hunting season. And it's kind of overlapping, but he was there all the way through February last year. Yeah. So he's there. This is the third year we've watched him and he, his pattern's the same. So he's on the north side. Now he's in the center. And that, that's what we end up seeing is even within our own land, one will shift from one side to the other. And then mm -hmm. it seems like they're never in that other spot, you know, for the rest of the rest of the season. You know, and I think too, over time, you know, when, you know, when, when you take one of your target bucks out, I think oh, sometimes yeah. like those other bucks are going to move into that. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. We see that a lot. Too. Yeah. Kind of like last year when you shot 45, yeah. we saw one of our other target bucks lucky move yeah, yeah. into that area. So it was really interesting to see, okay, he's gone. So true. Yeah. Now I have a new area to go into so that's you know other things that we're able to watch too and now we don't know where lucky's at we got his shed yeah. for the second year in a row on jen's birthday 
uh, March 25th, we found uh, his shed. She wanted to yeah. find some sheds birthday on her birthday. Sheds. and, and uh, Nothing you know, better, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But we haven't seen him back yet. No, that we, we can haven't. tell. So it's weird. Um, he's usually back by now. So he's another one where. Yeah. Just wondering. And, uh, he'll be a six year old. So yeah. huh. wondering where he's at. That's interesting. Just, you know, one of the Lucky. things we talk about um, in terms of property. So, you know, whether you talk about a 250 acre property or 500 acre property is these kind of overlapping home ranges for these mature bucks. Right. And, you know, for all of us who want to kill a mature buck, the goal will be stack as many of those home ranges within the boundaries that we can hunt as possible. Um, you know, knowing that some are going to be, you know, mostly in the property boundary, some may only be a small portion of the property. Um, but you know, when you guys start to think about even your own Minnesota farm and saying, okay, how can we overlap as many of these mature buck home ranges as possible? Because they're only going to tolerate each other for so long, especially during the this part of the season that matters for hunting. Um, what, what do you guys start to think about it? when you're laying that out? Well, that's, that's where it gets into, there's just so much work to do on the property because we're trying to establish a lot of little micro movements. And what I'm referring to are movements that a buck would take during the daylight. And the older he becomes, it seems like his core daylight area shrinks um, to an extreme, uh, extremely small area, five, 10 acres. Yeah, he ranges out during the rut, but the rest of the time he's going from point A to point B in a certain pattern. And he might travel in a linear fashion, three, 400 yards. And that's it during daylight. So if you start thinking around your property, if you have one food source, big food source that lasts the entire season, doesn't matter if it's on public land or private, and you have one bedding area, you don't make a lot of room for bucks. Mm -hmm. And you know, again, with thinking about that, they don't move that far during the daylight. Yeah, at night they fight, they move all over the place. They have a three mile home range, whatever it is on average. And that can vary. I, I think it's, it can be huge in wilderness areas, not three miles home range, a lot bigger. Yeah. But bottom line is you're just looking at that daylight time. And with the thought, they're not going to interact that much during the daylight time. Yeah, they will during the rut. So that's kind of what we're looking at, where we spend so much time because we have a lot of food plots. We've cut a lot. Of, I think we cut 18 new bedding areas this year. Wow. A lot of water holes, a lot of stand locations. And so you kind of feel that you're making your property, uh, you're kind of rolling out the welcome mat to have a higher number of mature bucks that relate to that property. And they might overlap, of course, um, but during the daylight, they have their own space. They have their own movement. And so if you only have a property, I mean, you could take a 500 acre property and if it's mostly all hardwoods, um, let alone that might even be rotational uh, cut hardwoods uh, where they're cutting blocks of 10 acres, 20 acres at a time. And, and then every few years, well, your bedding areas are always changing. You don't have a consistent bedding area. And if you don't have major food sources that can last the entire season, then those bucks are going to leave. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can kind of lull them into this pattern and say, you know what, we're going to give you everything you have and you're going to be able to stay away from the other mature bucks. I really do believe you can pack more bucks on a small parcel during the daylight. Yeah. And Which is what matters. Cool. Like yeah, it's maybe. All, it really is all that matters. So you're always thinking daylight movement. And that's why right now it's that in mid October, it's kind of that jostling around period. We're seeing new bucks come in. We had one buck leave. That's really disappointing. <laughs> And he, he left last year. It's like you get all these, it's like we gain by six or seven mature bucks, but we lose that one. His name is Barry. And last year, the last picture was like September 11th. This mm. year it was September 13th. And he didn't show up till December. It's like we have everything he needs in that area. He just, he doesn't like us. Yeah. For some reason. So I think it's Jen. Jen it, might, your fault. it might be. Yeah. I think he like sense that. The pheromones. Yeah. The yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's a nice, nice yeah. six year old. Yeah. Well, that definitely happens. I mean, th those two boxes I described on our property left what I would say, even at this point in the season, it's like we don't have anything that that sure. area doesn't have. I mean, there's you know, lush alfalfa fields, dense cover. Yeah. You know, everything you could want, acorns. But I think, like, maybe t to compliment or, or tack on like to, or a short answer. I think, I think it comes down to like density of, of habitat and mm -hmm. also availability in the sense that like, sure. even if you have dense habitat, if it's over occupied by does or, you know, just mm -hmm. deer in general, um, there's those less spaces are, for mature bucks to, I want to yeah, get in, are, I want to get into that, Jeff, if, if we can a little bit, it's like, yeah, yeah, we're having some success and stuff. And like, uh, maybe we don't have to spend the whole time on it here, but like I, I'm sensing, uh, 
pr- mainly because of like the uh, how hard our food plots are getting hit and stuff. That's where I see it the most. But also just sightings is is we have too many does mm-hmm. on our farm. Um, yeah. And I, that kind of comes hand in hand. Like, I mean, if we want to create as much food as possible on the farm, and not just food, you're, you're going to bring availability of, of yeah. all resources. You're going to bring cover. more deer in, right? You're going to bring more does in. Uh, so it's like, how do you balance the two? And that's why, like, I, I'm not a huge, unless you're in a herd building phase, you're in a herd number phase. Like in the UP of Michigan, I had that property, wilderness property. We had, I had up to 260 acres at one time. And they're trying to build a herd. Literally, I could walk on the sand trails for five days, not even see a fresh deer track after a rain. Mm-hmm. There just weren't a lot of deer there. They're, and historically, they're not um, in, in that entire region. Not a lot of food. There's no ag land, no mass crop, anything like that. And so using clover for four or five years to actually build a herd was incredible during the summertime because I was I just wanted to push numbers up. Sure. And But then at some point, I started cutting back on that clover. So instead of having eight and a half out of eight and a half acres of food plots be clover during the summer, that, and then I'd convert those in the fall, till them up, get a, a lot of fall plots planted because the clover wouldn't last that long in an up north setting like that. Um, then I'd convert it to maybe I had a, a one acre total of clover out of those eight and a half acres. But that was key though, was that to me, the first point of herd reduction, it's hard to argue that you can't have too many does, meaning like, yeah, they just take up too much space. They take up your property, small properties. If you have too many, you're not going to have room left over for mature bucks. Mm -hmm. So then people look at, well, we need to practice trigger control and trigger control to me is second. First is if you have too many deer, you cut the, cut the summer food sources. Now it's difficult. If you're surrounded by beans, you're surrounded by alfalfa, then there's not a lot you can do about that. But if you have food plots and you're creating summer food on those food plots and I'm, we have a food plot seed company. So, you know, if I wanted to, to be kind of go against my beliefs, <laughs> right. call a ton of summer food plots seed, and we would sell a lot of it. We well, sold a lot of seed last year. Yeah. It would make us a lot of money, but I don't believe in it. So well, it's well, not that. Why is that? Jeff? Why, 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 food, but. I'm sorry to cut you off. Why would you classify clover as a, as a summer food? And it's interesting because I kind of took the opposite approach. I want to hear your answer on that first though. Just because if summer, if clover is available, then in order to have it established for fall, like I love um, clover for hunting plots. Mm-hmm. So um, clover, then it's a pass through. You're not holding a huge number of does. So like out of our property here, we have about 17 acres of food plots, 17 and a half, somewhere around there in, in Minnesota here. And we have about an acre and a quarter total with a few small hunting plots in clover. Mm-hmm. So it's not enough clover spread out over the property sure. we have to put a big doe herd on there during the summertime, but that's the only food we have on the entire property during the oh. summertime. And, and then that, that clover dwindles during, so like November, I'm looking at it like where we're at, it's different than down in Kentucky or West Virginia, that clover is not real appreciable. Yeah. So we don't have a lot, a lot of food in those plots, but because those bucks have come randomly through the summertime and experienced a food source there, there's probably rub scrapes going on right now. There are, and then um, it's natural for them to come back during the rut. Now, by the time we get into December, those small little hunting plots aren't really attracting much at all. Right. But it's not, it's not magnifying the problem though, where if we put out of those 17 acres of plots, we have seven and a half acres of corn. If we change that into, and then we had another five acres of beans, we would just flood the property with summer does and fawns. And then when our fall plots are planted and they're coming up, then they're hammering our brassicas and our greens that we put in. So then we don't get the volume and then they're taking up space. That's interesting. Those does and fawns are on their neighbors. We have a neighbor to the North. They love shooting does. They love shooting any small buck. It doesn't really matter. And I kind of like that because then they, they thin the donor. We're going to probably have a group doe hunt in December this year on our property with some friends and neighbors just shoot does. But that you, you, to me, the best way to manage doe population is to not plant summer food. If you want to, it's yeah. pretty easy. If you want to expand your herd, your herd, plant summer food. If you mm. don't, don't plant it. Well, so check you this out. To- here's, here's what I did. And you can tell me why this is wrong. We, we, uh, my property is like, it seems like the opposite. It's like the, the reason that I selected clover this year, um, it is because it, first and foremost, the browse tolerance, uh, I'll say there's a, there's an element of like ease of maintenance that was also appealing. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, man, I just, you know, we put so much work into this other stuff. It would be nice to have some staples that I can, 
just maintain throughout the summer and it's pretty easy. We also are in a, I mean, a, a ex- we're, first of all, we're in a high deer density area, I would say. Uh, we're also in a predominantly agricultural area. And so having gone back to it this year, I planted, uh, I don't know, I'm going to say we've got uh, 10, 10, I don't know, set maybe similar to yours, maybe 17 to 18 ish acres of total Probably. food plots. Uh, 10 to 11 of that taken up by a, a, a giant bean field. And a lot of it's surrounded by, you know, I've got four or five acres of beans and I've got, I'm going to say two and a half acres of clover total. Mm-hmm. Um, so nothing, nothing crazy, but yeah, that's not a lot. Yeah. But, and so I wouldn't say that I wouldn't say that I saw a lot more does during the summer because of that, as much as I, I implemented those because my food sources prior to this year were just getting absolutely pounded. I was like, man, I can't, yeah. I can't sustain a brassica plot, you know, or, or purely brassica plot. So I need something with more browse tolerance. And also we need to shoot more does. Those are kind of like my two, my two things on top of the maintenance well you have the you have the beans too yep. so that's a little bit different how many acres of beans did you say you had? about 10 10 and a half so that's a lot so then you know what i find is they'll hit the beans over the clover during the summer like yeah they'll prior prioritize do you guys see that are they to me they prioritize prioritize beans over uh clover during yeah the summertime. well and it's not just so my really, beans there's beans everywhere yeah ag beans all around yeah. so they kind of left dars sure. alone slash they got some pressure but like in general all the beans in the whole area and the alfalfa the other green food sources were getting hit what i see throughout the summer is like it seems like there's doe families that like that's that's mm-hmm. that's their own little kitchen and then they probably do off go off to the bean fields or whatever but yeah, but it's not it's not a huge amount like as a percentage of your food plots. The beans are, but then you have beans everywhere. Around here we have alfalfa everywhere. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of similar. Deer can eat and dine anywhere and everything. Everywhere is about equal and there's In about the 50-50 ag versus, you know, cover around yeah. here. So we happen to have all cover or food plots on our property. And then it's ag surrounding. We have ag on you know, pretty much three sides, two and a half sides, basically, yeah. of our property. So it's a little bit different. And that's where every property is different, too, where um, there's properties, especially when you get down to southern Indiana, southern Illinois, Kentucky, West Virginia, uh, Tennessee, you can have a clover field that actually has a lot more volume lasting into December when you're getting frost and uh, we've already been down to 34 degrees, 33 right. degrees. And so we didn't have a killing frost, but it's it's got to be coming close. But when you get a killing frost mid-October, 20th of October, that clover just doesn't grow much after that. And so by the time you get into mid-November, there's not much clover left. Where if you're not getting your killing frost till November, early November, that makes a big difference too. That's mm-hmm. what I was going to say. Like I know when I lived in Mississippi, you know, a lot of people in Mississippi would plant, you know, maybe cereal grains too, but they also planted a lot of clover plots. Because I mean, yeah. th- that clover would continue to grow through December into January. Yeah. You know, it's just it, it always yeah. tended to to have that ability for graze tolerance. Well, what but is also it? Just what what is it where where we're at? You know, like uh, we, we're getting hit with frost too. Early. I mean, not too early, but you're go- it's going to go dormant here pretty quickly versus the further south you go. So well, it's going to slow slow it's not going to kill it but it's it's not going to grow either mm-hmm. and that's where that that's where you have a little bit of a different decision too so let's say i've been on properties in Miss, mississippi familiar with properties some in louisiana too where there's so much cover there's not a lot of ag land it's more i don't say wilderness but more heavily wooded heavily covered areas and your openings are your green fields mm-hmm. and so those are the type of places where you have all that cover and you don't really have the complement of ag and then you put a bunch of clover down you can just create giant doe populations and giant deer populations on your land. Mm. And that's where you, it becomes more of a balancing act of what do you do? You know, what do you, how do you uh, attract deer, still build a herd? And so that's where you start talking uh, what's worked in the past. How has brassica worked? How has oats? How have some kind, kind of peas worked? What about greens? Um, what has worked uh, to bring deer in the fall? And you start looking at how can we limit the summer food? So we can let those does spread out around the neighborhood and then, but still attract those starting in August, September back to the land. So you actually have a deer herd to hunt. And part of that's, you know, you're not going to, if you have great cover and you great food, you might have a lot of does in October, November, 
but it's different when you have a lot of does in July and August and you can't even get your fall crops to grow. Because yeah. You like, See, just attack them as soon as it comes. So if you can lay, lay, let those does and fawns come back in October instead of August, that's, that's part of the game too. Yep. See, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think maybe, you know, when we talked previously, cause I know you're, you've always been big on that. Like we don't want to make dough factories. We don't want summer food for that reason, basically. And I've always like had trouble understanding that. Cause I'm like, man, it doesn't matter if I plant summer food, like the does are going to be there uh, just because of the nature right. of our, you know, it's an agricultural area. Um, yeah. You just almost want them to spread out. So you're almost like sharing the does with your neighbors a little bit more. Hmm. If you look at it that way in a, in a doe or in a deer rich area where you have po- high populations. And I think, and you got to remember, like we, when we go to a client's, we see this kind of magnified because in Jeremy, you've been to a lot of clients too, where you, these people are spending a lot of money on their land. And this is all, you know, um, it's, it's all just luxury. Yeah. And so they're spending a ton of money on their land. They're, they're spending a ton of money on resources, of not only equipment, but for food plots, planting, managing their timber, they're doing a great job. So for that, the deer herd likes that and they're attracted to the land so we're seeing not the average landowner, we're seeing what happens when you add a lot of money and resources to habitat, how the deer herd relates. And all of a sudden you go to a high percentage of landowners that are sick of seeing a whole bunch of does. And Absolutely. So when, so when we go to a property, it's not saying, you know, like I was saying in Mississippi, Louisiana, you might do one thing different to a person in Northern ag versus a person in Southern Indiana, yep. same parcels. And so when you go to a property, it's not like you're saying, okay, these are the tactics that work and get to jam them in on your land. We're looking at it like, why do you have so many does? Why are the neighbors shooting the mature bucks? Mm-hmm. What are you spending? What are they hitting on your food plots? What are they eating? What have you done with your timber? Have the deer been there during the fall or are they more during their, during the summertime? Do they leave? Why do they leave? So we're trying to figure out and answer all these questions. And it comes up with a prescription for success on their own land. And that's where we're seeing those consistent doe factors. It's yeah. kind of like, this isn't the average person. It's when you, when you build it, they will come. Sometimes that's not necessarily a good thing. So I guess, Jeff, when, when you guys talk about some of the bucks that you've got on your Minnesota place, which let's say is, is 50, 50, like you've got a lot of ag around you, obviously it's not like, you know, hill country and big timber necessarily, but um, are, are you holding, or are you seeing those bucks throughout the summertime or are, are we talking about like now just kind of like, Hey, these guys should start showing up. We, uh, because we have a lot of fringe area and we're, um, surrounded by alfalfa, then we have certain bucks that we see all summertime in certain areas and they're not really going into our property. Like we have a scrape we call the bottom scrape that's in the middle of a chunk of timber. Well, a chunk of timber, meaning what we have around the house here, open fields, our pheasant habitat, yep. um, and but it's all cover or food plots but about 140 acres and the bottom scrape is right in the middle of that and we could go july august not even see a buck on it right. and then right now it's like jen watched the shooter in that area we call him ll beams he's a five-year-old he was on that bottom scrape an hour and a half before uh dark and he's right by his bedding area and so we were just waiting for him to come over <laughs> to jen he just didn't go that direction um but he's one that wasn't at that bottom scrape at all. That's where he's at during the fall because that's a core bedding right. area. He's 300 yards off the fields, 250 yards. Where during the summer, he was up above on the hermit plot, probably bedding up on a high point and getting a lot of wind and, and shade. And that airflow is coming across. And then he's just simply going out to ag yeah. every night. Now he's more, we're starting to hone him in on our property. So we get we get a lot of those bucks that shift a little bit and then we're waiting for some of those other ones to come in. And then because the property is so small in Wisconsin, the 30 acres of cover, we need this time of year to have that whitetail shift. So those bucks that were say a quarter mile away or even a mile away, now we start to see those consistently because then if we have those fall conditions, then again, we're just, we're just focusing on that small daylight movement. Yep. Um, and, and that's where we see that shift over, to right now where you know before who knows where it's at we have some on the fringe we're waiting for some to come back but now we're starting to lock in on some of those our neighbor shot one two years ago it was 189 uh chad he's a real estate agent next to us he's he's great hunter he's hunted the area that was a buck we had consistently in mid-october november december january we we're just waiting for him to come out over 
we had him all the year before and we didn't even get a video of him or, because he's over on Chad's beans. Chad shot him opening day in mid September. Yeah. And, uh, and it was one of those where if Chad didn't get him that first week or two, he would have shifted. Yeah. 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 And so we just, but then Chad will see 30, 35 does and fawns on a set with two bucks. And I'm over here seeing five does and fawns and seven bucks. It's just, you know, kind of, you shape your property different. You know, well, for, you yeah. Do that. So, so buck friendly. Uh, Jared and I just bought a farm in uh, West Central, Illinois, uh, 144 acres. We closed in September on it. And do you know that, Jeff? Can we tell you that? The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy. Man, Jared, we probably have been using Muddy products for at least 10 years now. It's a long time, dude. It's been a long time. And I can remember when it was simply just safety harnesses and camera arms of all things. And, you know, that's evolved to where you and I both have a bunch of Muddy box blinds as well. I would say a bunch. But, yeah, they, they've come a long way. And certainly the box blinds are, are huge. Shot that buck over your shoulder out of a Muddy box blind a couple of years ago. The harness and, and all of the other safety accessories really are, are a major component of, of what Muddy offers for me. Um, you know, we've had some injuries in the past, you know, I've had some, some tree stand accidents. This, this is all back before we were using, uh, you know, frankly, harnesses, mm -hmm. uh, the lineman's belt while we're hanging stuff, and the safe lines. I have those in every single one of, uh, you know, our fixed tree stands now. And uh, so we really have made safety a priority. Uh, that, that's a big deal for us. And, uh, you know, Muddy has everything we need for that. Yeah, and I think uh, the cool thing about Muddy is anyone listening to the Hunter podcast can save 20% using the code HUNTER20. That's H-U-N-T-R-2-0. Uh, anything that you can see on the Muddy Outdoors store online, use that code, save yourself 20% for this hunting season. Go Muddy. We've been talking, oh, right? I don't think yeah. So. so we just bought it, just bought it together on, in September. Keep, keep, keep Sorry, yeah, I'm on loop. Congratulations. Uh, thank yeah, you. Congratulations. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's, you know, so it's, what, it's, it's still new to us. Yeah. It's a really cool farm. We, we actually haven't been out since we closed. N yeah. No, we haven't. We've been out twice, but yeah, it's got. What? I don't know. The invite's in the mail. Yeah, it's yeah. coming. Uh, oh, yeah. It's in the mail. So we got, we've got we got CRP, and it, I mean, it's it sets up really nice. But, I mean, it's sea of agriculture around it, right? So crops are starting sure. to come down. New bucks are starting Literally, to Literally, as far in. as you can see, it's ag. And our, awesome. our realtor there, great guy, kind of, we call him like the gatekeeper out there. It's like, you know, if there's a good piece of hunting ground, you basically go through him. Otherwise, he and he wants the vet who's buying, right? He doesn't want guys coming in that are going to shoot 150-inch three-year-olds. Um, right. and so one of the neighbors to the North Hard of to us, manage to that level, but yeah, yeah, that's the idea. Uh, maybe a little bit of exaggeration, mm -hmm. but, uh, one of the neighbors to the North of us, that's a client of his had, what did he say? 30 bucks over 150 on his property this summer. Oh gosh. Wow. It's a 500 yeah. acre track. It's a 500 acre track a mile from us. And we had two bucks at that time over 150 on ours that none of them were mature, but mm -hmm. it, it's just. Right. You know, it's just they had a ton of beans. We were surrounded by corn Mainly where corn. we were, yeah. um, you know, but now as these crops come off, like obviously the oh, distribution yeah. starts to really happen. And so it, yeah. it's it's such a we're in it right. We're we're, you we're know, seeing in the next right week now. or two. We're hoping that more will show up. Yeah, so. but it's. Um, sure they will it's a hard That's thing for people to like a lot of listeners will call or, or write me and say because they know that a lot of my tracks are in big timber and they'll say you know it's first two weeks of october i don't really have a mature buck to hunt and i'm kind of in the same situation it's like it's a waiting game like tomorrow right. a five-year-old could show up whereas a lot of time when you're surrounded by ag or on the fringe you at least are seeing these bucks at some point in july august early september and they're around, right? And it's just for a lot of these properties, they're not. They're not there right now, and but they will be. It's just a waiting game. Right. I think that when we go to properties, like one of the easiest properties to manage is one that's surrounded by ag. Mm -hmm. Because you can have a captive audience. Once the, once the crops are down, as long as you provide great habitat, thick cover, and uh, some food sources, then, then it's really uh, you establish that core area where you just let them hang out all day they have to hit your food on the way out to yep. the ag field for the moment that might be a mile away and yeah. so some of those are just incredible properties we share our borders at least you know one and a half borders with some people but um it's it is pretty cool i like those surrounded by ag it's kind of like they it does change i bet you that property you guys have that's going to be that's going to be outstanding i love i love to hear that kind of stuff 
Yeah, we, we're excited about we're it. Really it's cool it, in. it's familiar to me because my my farm in Ohio is is predominant. It's not as much ag, frankly. Mm-hmm. It's just not you know the sure. west central illinois is just the dirt is so good i mean those guys are getting whatever two two eighty three hundred dollars an acre for crop leases where i'm at in ohio you get 75 yeah you know it speaks to the, oh, the yeah. difference of soil quality hey, but jen when did you see because jen's old property she hunted was mostly all wooded in the hills mm-hmm. right yeah so where was the nearest ag field oh uh it was quite a while i, I mean talking, miles probably yep. two and a half three she was in the wooded hills Kind of like some near the bluffs of the Mississippi. Yep. And, um, and then when did you start seeing the mature box usually? Um, I would say typically it would be beginning of October. Every once in a while you would see, you know, one just kind of strolling on through in mm-hmm. September. But a lot of times it was in that beginning of October. Yeah. You know, be- the middle of October before you really started to see your, you know, the those main bucks that, you know, were coming back. So it was a lot different than, mm-hmm. um, you know, being next to an egg, you know, and as you opposed didn't to have, beautiful woods. You didn't have big food there. No, we didn't. It was, you know, it was, you know, a little small, you know, food plot here and there. So it wasn't, mm-hmm. it, you know, we didn't have a lot of. To um, like hold a deer. Right. Because a lot yeah. of it was, you know, like steep wooded area, you know, so there wasn't a lot of flat areas. The flat areas we did have, you know, we cleared a lot of, you know, trees yeah. and, you know, made as, you know, much food, you know, depth of cover was important too, you know, so we, you know, did as much as we could, but yeah, it was mid-October most of yeah. the time. Yeah. I really, um, most of my property, so this, this Illinois one is really the first ag piece I even own. Everything I own is, is big woods, timber. Um, I've got one in Kentucky that was old pasture, which is funny. We were talking about it earlier. So I bought this, um, this old pasture farm in Kentucky, not far from a cabin I already have there. And, uh, it's awesome. It's got like 45 acres of open pasture ground up on this big top Ridge. And then everything's just, I mean, tens of thousands of acres of hardwoods around it not not a crop for this is jeremy's style for miles he likes right? big hardwoods and so yeah. you know the the easiest thing to do obviously especially because i had open areas go in and establish food on it you know so i put 14 acres yeah. of food on this thing and i mean i've got deer on it and i've got bucks on it but it's funny because i know that the deer in the area don't know the foods there yeah yet. that's what it is like they like they haven't like, been through there yet because there's so many acorns right now on the ground in that area yeah. they they just yeah. haven't ventured to find it because for <laughs> they've probably never even seen an ag field when they do find it they're gonna be like oh my yeah, for God. 14 years it's been <laughs> old pasture you know and, and cattle pasture now it's got you know there's a three acre brassica field here there's a two acre wheat field over here there's guys you know, a box alfalfa. blind over there yeah, there's a box blind there <laughs> with me in it so but yeah it, it's it's funny because i think people um whether it's getting access to a new property or, or buying something uh, and, and I found myself in this too. It's just, you gotta, there's a patience aspect of things that that's kind of weird. And I think to your point, Jeff, like ultimately this time of year in daylight movement, I have to narrow it down to that because that's really all that matters is right during this time of year and during daylight hours. Other than that, it, it could be great. There could be 200 inch deer running around. It doesn't matter if I never see them and I never have a no. chance to kill them. No, and what we find too is that, and this is something I've seen, and you know, again, we analyze the properties you go to, and people, you know, owned them for seven, 10 years and wonder what's going on. But what we see is like when you have a property that's a nocturnal property, meaning those big giants in the area don't come onto the property unless they're at night, middle mm-hmm. of the night. And a lot of that's hunting pressure related, food source related, and covered, those three. And a lot of them, all three combined, meaning they're not managing their hunting pressure, they don't have good quality food sources that last the season. And they don't have a, they don't have good quality cover because it's open, so you can't you can't compact deer into a certain areas or compartmentalize their bedding areas. So when you see that happening, not only do the mature bucks not come onto the property as much during the middle of the night, they just don't come onto the property at all. Right, because it's not even a part of their wheelhouse. Like the neighbor literally a half mile away is shooting a hundred and eighty inch buck two years in a row, and this property never even saw it, never yeah. even got it on camera, and they have lots of cameras out. So you can you can establish a property to the local buck herd that this property should not be entered during the daylight at all. And why would they even include it in their home range at night then? Yeah. It's yeah. One of those things. And so in and, and kind of what Jeremy, what you're saying too, like you have a wooded property. Think of all the work you do to put in 14 acres of food plots there, manage the timber, get the deer to know what's there, establish a pattern of use over years. Where you go into an ag piece, 
and you buy a chunk of timber, 40 acres, and it's surrounded by ag, it's in a big buck area, it's year one. You're yeah, on year one. Place. You're you yep. like here. Our first thing was established. They they only had beans. So you look at all the pictures here in Minnesota. They had five acres of beans. Why are there only bucks and velvet? Twenty right. twenty five pictures they had on the wet on the real estate listing were uh, bucks and velvet. So it's get rid of the beans, put actual fall plots in, change the hunter access. So we're not parking by the redneck blind on the middle of a one and a half acre food plot and wondering you know the side by sides right there, wondering why the deer aren't on the property. Change hunter, you know how you hunt it. Change the food sources, and then that first year you just. You get them because it's an egg. Mm. Are you getting so, excited about our it? Illinois place? I am, I'm about getting this. Way, I am too. way more excited about our too. Illinois place listening to this. I, I'm excited about your Illinois property. That's, uh, <laughs> well, that's we, felt, those, we felt we felt that on scene. We felt that so, way when we bought it, Jeff. But like when we when we were on it, we had the gut feeling that we're like, this is it. We got to be here. There was some trail cam, you know, uh, stuff. There was some some sheds off the property that the landowner had had killed some really nice really nice ones. Yeah. And but frankly, ever since we put up cameras in. September sometime August September August August you know it's been it's you know we have two or three mature bucks but and it's just kind of been a waiting game we're like man our you know when the crops come oh, down no, guys, I know I know just wait till the and that's the thing too that's that's the typical out-of-state rut hunt property yeah you just go sit and shoot shoot a big one I'm not saying it's that easy but yeah hey if you find a property out there let's say it's a half mile long 30 acre piece you know, fairly cheap and it's got like eight acres of open cover where you can put food plots in and the rest is thick cover. Can you let me know about it? Yeah. Absolutely. It's surrounded by ag. Mm, it's absolutely. got a creek going in the middle of it. Yeah. I think that was the hardest part when we'll we saw a piece of ours. Yeah. We'll cut off a 40 for you. When we, when we saw this one, um, what was hard to fathom and you, you really could only see it from an aerial view. There is a creek running through this one um, too, Jeff. Is that it, it yeah, is literally thousands of acres of tillable around it, mm -hmm. like thousands of right. acres. And the only real, uh, cover when that, it, when those, especially the corn comes down is along the creeks. Right. So if you own a parcel along one of these feeder creeks or the main river there, uh, right. Well, also they have to come through. Also our farm is one of the only ones that the, the seller had put into CRP. CRP. So there's like 50 acres in CRP. The problem is he's, mo cool. he's mowing it every year. So we, we don't know. Yeah. How he mowed doing, it when we were there yeah, in August, right? Right before we're we got not doing there. that anymore. So I don't know how tall it's going to be there. We, we probably hey, hey, go ahead, Jeff. That can make a huge difference. We had that property we hunted for 12 years in Wisconsin, and it had like a 50 acre CRP field in the middle. They only mowed it one year. So imagine we had a lot of our bedding areas where deer would literally doze and fawns bed like 20 yards into the woods right next to the CRP. They none of them bedded in the CRP because it wasn't it didn't stand. It wasn't yeah, it wasn't big thick enough to hold them. Summertime, great. They were out there, but during the during the hunting season, they weren't there. So when they cut the CRP, now imagine the cover that was provided by the CRP against those wood lines, those doze and fawns instead of bedding 20 yards and they bed a hundred yards in. Because yep. they could sit in there 50 yards and look right out into the fields. Well, they don't like that. Yeah. So that taught me a lot too. Even if we had 50 feet of switchgrass on the outside of that timber, it would have, it would. So what it did is it, it took out, if you imagine this irregular 50 acre CRP field, and when he mowed it, it took out 100 yards of potential bedding cover all the way around that field. Yeah. Which when you do the math, a a week, it was a 190 acre piece. We probably lost 70 acres around that field. It was, it was a big giant U irregular shapes so mm -hmm. i kind of think of that with that crp field you know that can make a big dent in mowing um mowing yeah. that losing that cover as it relates to depth of cover and how many deer you can actually what are you what are you well, saying what are you property too. oh yeah oh yeah so, the bucks are the ones that left the does and fawns stayed so what are you saying with bucks. that you're saying when it mowed it, it hurt it significantly oh drastically yeah just because it it took the appearance of cover up against the woods and to me, it's like that first layer of bedding takes place. Like if you have a food plot, you have heavy screening against the edge of that food plot. Now, now allows you to bed does and fawns within 30, 40 yards of that food plot edge. And that frees up space on the interior of your woods then for bucks. So if you have open hardwoods right to the edge of that food plot, then those does and fawns, if they don't want to bed within a hundred yards of that plot because it's so open and they can look out in the open field, people in the field can look in, deer yeah. on the field can look in, predators, everything else. Then um, you're taking out basically from 40 yards in to 125 yards in yeah. where 
box could have potentially layered in bed. So that's why that first layer of screening is so critical. So in a big field, if you mow it all, and now it's just open 12 inch, 15 inch high grass going into the edge of the woods, it pushes all the deer yeah, back. Sure. Uh, right. in bedding uh, into a, into that second and third layer of bedding. And all of a sudden you, you don't have any room left over for bucks because those yeah. funds, they do take up the space. And, and those, it's only if you have enough space left over, if you have room for bucks. Were you in your head thinking how much are you charging for a consult now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, those, those wood blocks aren't big to begin with, right? Most well, it's of also them not are, a contiguous 50 acres either. Yeah, There's it's, three fields. Yeah. It's, you know, most of that is just narrow fingers that are yeah, along yeah. the waterways and stuff. Yeah, a lot of edge. Yeah, which is great. But to your point, Jeff, as you start to take away that CRP from the edge, like there isn't any more room, right? So a, a mature yeah. buck who may have felt very secure in one of those fingers now can see out well, hundreds of we, yards. We also don't know what the CRP right. field looks like in the fall. It's it's not like a, a predominantly switch mix or anything. So we don't know. It's got blue stems and Indian grass and gamma grasses in it. I mean, it, it's it's classic it's native warm there. season. In like down there, that might that might hold up to a couple stones from November December. Like yeah. up here, it'd be flat. Yeah, but I don't it's, think we get a whole lot of snow well, that, where we're at. That it's, was an important part of it. Is like at least in the last few years, their snow. I mean, they haven't gotten much. Um, so it would right. potentially hold up a little bit better into November and December there. Well, our. I don't know if it's a pipe dream or just what we'd like to do. It's like we, we had talked about going out there and burning mm -hmm. uh, portions or, or all of it off at some point and then frost seeding switch into it like right after that burn. Right. And But I would still want to. So when I have switch, I really like it to come in pure okay. because then it stands up to anything, especially down there. You would never have to worry about it coming down during the hunting season. Mm -hmm. What do you think so about disc and uh, strips of switch in it? I think that's a great idea and using this. So what you do is you use your, your current CRP as your base form of cover. Yep. And then you, um, and then you provide the screening on the outside and patches within. Correct. Um, and I like irregular patterns. So it's yep. not, I don't think mature bucks like straight lines. I, you see that they avoid uh, logging roads that are yep. half mile long, 20 feet wide. They, they jump over them. They don't bed near them. So I like, so it kind of like, let's say you surrounded those CRP fields without looking at it, surrounded in 20, 30 foot wide switch mm -hmm. um, screening edges. And then on the inside, you take eighth acre, quarter acre. That's all relative to the size of the field. If you have a 10 acre field, eighth acre and quarter yeah, acre. We got a 30. Awesome. <laughs> we have a 30 acre yeah. CRP field. <laughs> so a 30 acre CRP field, you could have one, two acre blocks of switch on the inside. It's not even that the deer are bedding in the switch. They're bedding around the edge on of the On the edge switch. of it. So yeah. And you have pockets of switch. And then because the CRP is more diverse, now you have uh, some form of browse in there and food because you'll have flowers, forbs, forages, various grasses that they might browse on. Now you have that best of both worlds where you have the heavy switch for screening and creating more like thermal pockets, heavy cover on the inside. And then you have the browse around it, mm -hmm. which is why we sell our, we have our, um, our pollinator blend and yep. then our switchgrass. We don't encourage people to plant them together unless it's like along your driveway and it's sure. pretty like we do here. It's more you separate them because yeah. then you have the best of both worlds. You have more of a, and we don't, we only have one grass in our pollinator blend because we don't want grass in there. It's a big blue stem just for perching grasses for yep. birds, butterflies, bees. And then you have the, and that's only like, uh, it's less than 5%. Would you ever too recommend planting like almost like a diversity pocket? Like we're like, we've yeah, that's, here? that's the next step as we go into that area. And it depends on if you want it to turn into a portion of it, to turn into woods, or you want to maintain it as ag in the future. That's a conversation with the clients we have, but we, we put in 10 diversity pockets here that are uh, 30 feet in diameter, which is 94 feet of fencing. And then we put 13, 14 uh, shrubs around the outside. Mm -hmm. A lot of, shrubs like red osier dogwood yeah um hybrid uh willows uh hybrid poplars we put four trees in the middle of that cluster and then fenced it off you take the fence down after a couple of years but the whole idea is in five years that's 25 feet tall those pop hybrid poplars mm. but if you don't fence them the deer eat them now you have browse pockets high quality browse hardwood regeneration browse and woody shrub tips in the middle of those fields in pockets and they could be 30 acre field you could have you know seven of those pockets, right. those pockets is, you need a hundred of them. Yeah. 
I won't ever ask you of your uh, consulting ability, but I bet <laughs> I bet Jeff would like to see because we laid it out. Like we got a map, we've got we planted some food plots, we've got some stand locations. Yeah, I think I think you'd be proud of us. We had know? like two. We had like literally four weeks to plan it and well, plant it, dude, it. it was one of those farms that like. The, it was one of those farms where it was fairly easy. Like Jeremy and I both looked at it and in pretty quick order, we're like, yep, that's where this stuff needs to go. <laughs> and the general rule of thumb, and I've applied this at my farm and I think in, in general, uh, in any like uh, a high deer density area, what I've gone off of is anything less than an acre for me is, is clover uh, or potentially like a cereal grain. Uh, anything sure. from an acre to what I think would sustain a standing grain plot in most cases, three to four acres is brassicas and then anything bigger than that i go i go standing grain and we mm -hmm. we kind of have that principle on this we've got mm -hmm. three or four small clover plots we've got two which had rye in it this year and rye we mm -hmm. put rye in everything just to make mm -hmm. sure something so one, one of the things i really like to see is so like out here when we have the bigger plots like we have one that's four and a half acres another one that's two another one's acre and a quarter two and a half acre plot by the house here. It's like three and a half acres. And I don't know if I'm missing an, oh, no, it's, uh, two acres on those larger plots. And those are anchoring the deer movement around the entire farm. Uh, we plant the same combinations in there of greens, brassica and corn is what we use. Hmm. So we don't want to see like, uh, I don't want to see like a corn field over there, a bean field over there, right. or a brassica field over there, or a clover field over there. So we have the same pattern around the entire property mm -hmm. and that way going back to those micro movements of mature bucks there's no reason for daylight bucks to be on top of each other because they all have their own little yep. honey hole of diversity of food um, that they can go to and establish a little micro movement and then the only thing else we do is we have the clover plots as a complement um, and their little hunting plots ours our largest clover field would be maybe, is it a quarter acre? Like the, maybe a third of acre at the apple plot. And yeah, I would say probably about a third. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. And so those are our small hunting plots. And other than that, every plot's the same. Hmm. You know, well, it's a combination. Well, the way. That way we can spread deer out. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. You've, we've talked about that before. I think the, the way that this one sets up is, um, well, you know what? We. Yeah. Yeah. The, the biggest plots that we can get onto this thing is there is a, an existing three and a half acre alfalfa field and it's, you know, it's not the best alfalfa, but there's alfalfa. Mm -hmm. in it. And on the largest, uh, CRP tract is 30 acres. We can take out up to 10% of it, which is about three acres. Mm -hmm. So we have an opportunity to do two, roughly three acre, you know, plots. if you want to call that destination uh, there, it's on the verge of like, I don't know if that's big enough to, you know, have a standing. I grain. mean, it, I think the Jeff and Jen's point, an anchor plot, like for that area, the, those would be plots that could anchor that area being three acres worth. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. and, we, and the good thing is like corn, we don't get, we're not experienced, of course, a lot of browsing on our corn during the summertime. You know, some areas you do like up, up North where there's a lot of woods, wilderness area, not a lot of summer food. Sure hammer standing corn i've seen it eat it down to like knee high they say knee high by fourth of july but it's knee high in september because they just eat it all the way down the stock everything where here they don't eat it and so that anchor plot you can refer to it as an anchor plot because it's anchoring movement all, all season long it's also i call it a holding plot because you want to hold deer before it, until dark and then after that who cares where they go and that's you guys are blessed with that because they can just go to the ag field that's standing in the moment or the cornfield that's mm -hmm. just cut. They go a mile in that direction or this direction after dark. You hold them until dark, and then they go to their destination after dark. And what are you putting into those anchor plots? Ours is um, we have a fall blend, and this works out really nice. We plant late seed, late planted buckwheat mixed with tilled radish, uh, really light oats and peas, mm -hmm. and and that's got vetch in there too. So it's kind of imagine they, they eat the, the tops of the buckwheat. So we have video like about a month and a half ago, a month ago, where bucks would come through and they literally just top the buckwheat. They mm. eat the flour in the head yep. and you can find the stems out there. One of the next things they eat are the peas. Then they're eating tillage radish because that's the earliest brassica yep. they eat. And then they'll finally, we'll find that they'll eat the oat head after the oats come out and they have that seed head. So imagine they're taking a bite of green here and then they, they step over and they just eat the oat head where if you just had a field of oats, they wouldn't touch it. Right. But because it's right in the field, it acts more as a sure thing. And then the vetch is down below like clover. 
And so then they have that, they have multiple layers, multiple food. And then we have brassica. So like if we had a green area that was, let's say we had a three acre field, we might have an acre and a half of corn. And then we'd have three, acre, three quarters of an acre of that green blend. And then we have three quarters of an acre of brassica. So you and are breaking those fields more, up though, potentially. Yes. Okay. Yep. Well, yeah, I guess definitely. I and what's really cool is when you first establish those fields, we put switchgrass on the outside, which might be up to 30 feet wide, 20 feet wide, 100, depending on where it's at. And then we put corn and then you have the greens on the inside. And then two to three years later, you're rotating the corn to the inside and the greens to the outside because now the switchgrass is enough mm-hmm. cover, cover for screening on the outside. Right. I guess in my mind, I'm trying to figure out how to, yeah, how to, how to stack like, you know, those the, the clover and brassica plots against like your, your method, there's more like, you know, we have, we have an anchor plot is basically what you, so it's like, we have a, a combination of stuff here. Like I'm trying to figure out in my mind how to stack that against what we've done so far is that I have basically what I said earlier is anything less than an acre I've got in clover. There's whatever we have three or four of them. Mm-hmm. The, the intermediary plots is we have two, I don't know what you call those two acre brassica, brassica plots, mm-hmm. two and a half is the biggest one. And then now we have these larger sections that we're like, not that we can't go back on. I mean, so, frankly, some of those brassica plots may be total failures. Oh, sure. I, I think to Jeff's point around, and I, I haven't thought about it on this farm, but from these micro movements, like <clears throat> those, I get it. those two, I get it. Those two acre sense. plots could be like, so basically the two, three acre plots and the two, two acre plots could all be in the same to create these micro movement areas these yes. anchor areas on the and and to be honest jeff for me the hardest part of looking at it is even though it's 144 acres because it's got so much open ground like it looks small to me yeah. who's used to 230 acres of timber mm-hmm. right like that right. that's the right. weird concept that that i'm having trouble with whereas if you have four of these quote anchor plots in there like this is 20 acres for this plot this is 40 acres for this plot this is 70 acres sure. for this plot and we have some of that right. i mean yeah that's that's what you look at it's kind of like i go to a lot of properties where yeah they have 140 acres and let's say it's three quarters of a mile long and the south half of it is not supported by food right so yeah. it's almost like yeah throw away and then at the same time, what ends up happening is you have those big dominant does. They're going into this food plot and whatever it is. Mega does is what we call it. They want to hit brassica. Yeah. It, they go over to that brassica field and and then the does are already on that brassica field. They start fighting. And so you have all these does and fawns fighting over the same food sources because they're always changing in attraction and pull from one food to the uh, one food plot to the next. And then what do the bucks think about that? To right. me, they don't like stress at all. So now you have these does that are fighting every night over the same food source. And they, they actually can't hold as many does and fawns on the property then either. Hmm. Because you're, you're, you're expecting to pack a whole bunch of does and fawns into the same food plot because it's the one that's attracting at the time. Whereas if they're all the same, you want the same dumb movements from the same doe groups into the same plots all season long. And when you have that consistency, then that's what's established. So if you don't have the consistency of those does and fawns hitting the same food plots every single day, then you're not going to have micro movements of bucks that relate to that same movement every day. And it's not because the does are there. It's because the does are there, meaning it's attractive. If the does aren't there, why would a buck be there? Yeah. So a lot of people look at it kind of in reverse, like the bucks are there because the does are there, which is kind of true. The bucks are there despite the does being there. And because you've balanced the number of buck, does on that field, now the bucks will be there. And uh, and again, if you have a property, you couldn't have a property that's all bucks because if does and fawns aren't attracted to the property, why in the heck? Would yeah, why would a buck? Sure. So, so that's you think of that in every food plot everywhere. And then you have because it might be a corner of one of those plots is clover, and you have a blind looking over it or a stand. And it's this little hidden corner. It's like a staging plot before they get into the rest of the big one. And then that's screened by switchgrass. We have something like that. Mm-hmm. Like that? Yeah. Yeah. Where they can go into the clover that's screened and then they're on the way to the big, big yeah. food plot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or it's next to a big food plot, meaning that the big food plot's right across there over a skinny draw that's 70 yards wide. And then they just go through this plot to get to that one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The overarching challenge on this one for us too is it's ten hours away, <laughs> you know, from us here. So yeah, you know, it's not like we can go out every other week and be spraying stuff. And it's like no. you know, we have to be pretty uh, efficient efficient with our travel time. Mm-hmm. So That's Wisconsin was seven hours for us. So we we would have to. There were many times I left in the morning, 
drove seven hours, sprayed for three hours, and then was back that night. Wow. Yeah. What, what you had to do. We couldn't, I couldn't afford to stay in a hotel and couldn't afford to pay to someone to, you know, to do it. So we just <laughs> yep. out spray and back. Yeah. Basically what you had to for. So there's a house on this property we just bought, Jeff. There's a house and really? there's there's two barns. And there's an old guy in the house. There's an old guy living <laughs> in the house. Yeah, that we gave we gave him two years to kind of It was the basically the farmer didn't want to he he ultimately didn't want to sell the farm. He's lived there his entire life. He's in his eighties. Um oh, yeah. you know, and so th- it was listed for sale temporarily by his insurance agent. Yeah, which was really funny. <laughs> and so yeah. what it, that's what, what I, I said, Jen. I was like, oh, I didn't know they could do that. What, what, oh. uh, yeah, what license it, is a license, right? What ended up us getting the deal was essentially saying, hey, we don't want to kick you out of the house. We just want the farm and hunt the farm. So you stay in the house for another two years. Just hang out, you know, and yeah, we're good. Sure. Uh, well, that sounds like a great setup, guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it it's and the house is. I mean. Granted, it, it has some issues that need addressed, but it's it was in surprisingly good yeah, shape. Yeah, better shape like we than were, we thought. Well, it'll be a nice camp someday. I think. Are you, are you guys in a two hundred inch area there? Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. We're, that's that's crazy. I have a video coming out on Tuesday how to shoot a two hundred inch buck, and you go through all the strategy of what it takes to shoot a four or five year old buck or older. But then the last point is uh, that I write in at the end is uh, basically move. Yeah, you right. can't can't you're kill them if they're not there. Area, you're not, you know, you're not going to, and I've been in areas in Ohio where for 15 years in a row, they've seen a 200 inch buck and sometimes multiple ones, 15 years in a row. We're pretty close, Jeff, to where Ben just killed that one. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's. Yeah. We've had rumors. Um, uh, last year, the property across from us had a 220 non-typical on it. Um, wow. Yeah. And Which I mean has us feeling like, man, how do you not get excited about that? But also, like the best buck we have on camera right now, it, a mature one, anyways, is is one forty. Yeah, I mean we've got some yeah, hammer, mid, some hammer. Mid, we got hammer three year old, mid fifties, yeah. three year olds. Like the genes are there, like no we, doubt. It just they got to be yeah. five. We've held some sheds off of pi- yeah. pictures I've seen on the property. I'm like, this is a giant. Yeah. So well, you got to think of those uh, those CRP fields right now as like almost big blockers. Yeah, where they're not really offering much. They're not offering. Very oh, and they good may even be mowed. I don't know what how they bounce back. Yeah, since I bet August. they're not doing. They're literally no value to the deer right now. Yeah, so they're big. It's kind of like um, when you have hardwoods, Jeremy. You've seen where it's like just a big open block yeah. of mature hardwoods. Not only does it not hold deer, it's not feeding deer, but then a mature buck, a truly mature, doesn't want to walk through it. Not at all. Like. Yeah. So then it's not. It's it's like it's like uh stopping the movement that could have been taking place through the entire parcel so they can't even relate to the entire parcel as a whole mm-hmm. yeah it's it's an but, interesting uh, play i mean perfect. they inevitably as these deer start to cruise more we will capture giant well so here this camera. is an important question oh this is important because yeah. jeremy and i are considering like a trip and you know, if we weeks. were talking about like I don't know, t- yeah, in two weeks. From well, now, if you're listening to this, possibly today, we may be. We yeah, may we're be talking in about that today. last week of October. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, we're possibly right in. Like last week of October into Halloween, you know, expecting crops should be off for the most part by then. Hopefully, something showed. I, you think we should wait, or, or you think I would for that area down there? If I had to pick like a week to hunt, it'd be uh, <laughs> so like. Uh, my daughter and future son-in-law, they're coming out and he's going to be hunting public land in the area. And she's going to be hanging out with our son, Jack. She'll probably hunt opening day gun season with us, but that's uh, October 27th that week. And it's almost like, um, what is that? But I can't think of the next Friday is the third or fourth. Yep. Yeah. Um, that's if I just had to pick cruising bucks, that area, I'd, I'd be going that weekend, the 27th through the third. Yeah, with the thought that I'm hunting the pre-rut bucks, which would be the 27th through the 3rd, I'm hunting those bucks that are already on the property. Now, maybe you have a, a, a giant that's moved in two or three and he's he's steady by then. But if not, um, and, and I would only go down there if you had one giant that was locked in. Otherwise, I'm looking for long-range cruisers in the middle of the rut, hoping to catch one of those 180, 200 inches from the neighbors coming over. Yeah. Uh, after he's bred a door or two in the pre rut. 
The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Muddy and Stealth Cam Trail Cameras. Cell cams, cell cams, cell cams. What an evolution the industry has seen and we've experienced personally over the past five, 10, you know, whenever cameras were invented, right? It's like, man, it's totally changed the way that we inventory deer, pattern deer, and ultimately the decisions that we make when we're going out to hunt. They're a serious piece of the puzzle and, and uh, you know, that information is invaluable for us. We trust the Muddy and Stealth Cams, you know, together to be able to, to collect any of that information. Yeah, I mean, as an admitted trail cam addict, you know, I've definitely been guilty of of under hunting places or relying too heavily on that information that's come in that said it's an invaluable tool to the overall management plan and strategy that i have for my own properties or even hunting public land it doesn't matter we have a finite amount of time in going out and hunting so when you and i are after a particular class or quality of deer usually a mature buck we can't waste time hunting an area where that deer doesn't exist. And those cell cams provide that information that allow us to spend the time in the area with the highest chance to accomplish our goals. Say it all the time, man. It can't kill them if they're not there. That's it. So right now, any of our listeners can use uh, code HUNTER20 to get 20% off either muddy or stealth cameras. Uh, we're certainly going to be taking advantage of that, and we hope you guys do too. Yep, check out Stealth Cam and Muddy. Jeff, do you firmly believe in those areas that are predominantly ag like that, that these mature bucks are really holding a core area of like 10 acres, 15 acres? Yeah. Or, I mean, it could be, they have a 30 acre chunk of timber or, but it's almost like what's different there is you're packing a whole lot of deer into a small area. So we hear. So yeah. yeah. I've, I've like been on a property in Ohio where the client was 26 acres and neighbor had 20. And that 46 acres was the biggest chunk of timber within two miles in any direction. Yep. To the point where his wife, he would go into the woods and his wife would go, there's a small wood lot, like five acres away and another one, three acres, whatever. She would literally go to, after he's in a stand and go and get out on the road and make a bunch of noise. So the deer would run across the open fields because they had nowhere else to go. Wow. Except there. So the point is that you can pack a whole lot of bucks and does into a very small area. It's deceiving because if you say, oh, we're going to pack that many deer into around here in Minnesota, or we're going to do that in a northern wilderness, or we're going to do it in a Kentucky wilderness or yeah. big wooded area. It's not going to happen. Not going to happen. There they, don't. they have a, the, the space is at a premium. What do you think that does on the hunting side? Sorry, Jeff, I didn't mean to interrupt you. What do you think that does on a hunting side as we get here towards the end of October, early November? I mean, you know, I think about my places in Ohio and Kentucky where you know, deer, these mature bucks are crossing paths, but they don't really want to. In those cases, like they don't have a choice. They're going to cross paths here. I think it's a beautiful opportunity because now you take a property that had fairly open timber cover, not great food sources, and those bucks are going to wander, especially on the creek systems. And then all of a sudden they come to your land and it's like, hey, I got great food. I got great cover. Smells good. There's not hunting pressure. You're not out there every day. I'm going to stick around and stay. Yeah. And it might be that you see that you're, you have a three or four year old that all of a sudden becomes local and he's a core buck on your property. Well, you know, you know, you have him next year. And he came in on. October 27th this year or November 12th or December 1st. And the next year, all of a sudden you see him as the end of October, early November. He shifts mm, we do. Time. I mean, we've got a really nice three-year-old that's consistent. I mean, out there, I think, you know, we'd both hope to get them to five or six. Really. We'd love to. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, some of these, we've, we've got two three-year-olds that are for sure in the fifties um as 10 points both 10 points of the split g2 one that on one just side. showed up the other day and one that's been there all summer yep yeah that's pretty awesome we're like in a we get a three-year-old they're usually 130-ish yeah i'd say so 140 we're like a four-year-old to be in the 140s mm -hmm. but, i mean then we have those super bucks that all of a sudden like chad sure. he thought was five-year-old where it was 130 170 189 wow you know and, and he had sheds from each year so they just, it just jumped. And, but then we have bucks that we've like lucky should be seven years old. I don't think he's gotten out of the one forties. Yeah. We're the and same. So we have bucks like that too. We're the same and, in Ohio, Jeff. We, we have a bunch of like, yeah, I've got, yeah. you know, I've got, I don't know how many four year olds I've got, but I mean, all of them are, you know, 135 to 155 mm -hmm. type of deal. And then, yeah. but we have a lot of two and three year old, you know, future booners that you that just don't have many five year olds. And, and I've got one, I've got one three-year-old that went from one, he was maybe mid 50, maybe 150 mid fifties to, I think he's pushing 170 this year as a four-year-old. So we, we do get those too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have, to, it's, we have more of a range here. We have uh Chad has a buck on his property and his property is only like, 
uh, from our edge and not even a half mile over across the farm field, then a skinny 50 and then Chad, he's got like a hundred and some, but he's got a buck over there. It's a typical 12 with some splits on it. So it'd be a 14 point, but typical 12, which we don't get around here. And it's got long tines and we think it's two. Wow. So it's, at, at best it's three. Wow. But that's the type of buck that by five, that's, that's um, going to be pushing 190, 200. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. that's your future 200. I mean, that's, I think yeah, people. That's how I got do not shoot list that's like chad's already he just sent me a text that with a picture and said don't shoot this buck yeah <laughs> it's funny i don't so he's up i don't think that um it, it's funny saying it out loud but i don't think it's that these potential 200s don't exist i think they just don't get to 200 because of age like there's plenty of places oh, whether it's in i mean i've got one in middle of nowhere kentucky that you know i'm if the kids see it they're going to shoot it but you know, he's a three-year-old, yeah. probably high fifties as a mainframe 11, you know, and yeah. if he gets to five, he'll be all over eighties and nineties. Um, you know, and it's just, but odds are he won't get to five and and well, that's just the reality. Seeing, we're seeing around here in Wisconsin, we're seeing, we're watching five and six-year-old bucks. And so you can kind of get a guesstimate. Like I've hunted since Oh two in Wisconsin and there was a 187, a 184, 185 shot. And that was, I'm not saying, I'm not complaining about those sizes. Those are sure. awesome bucks. But that's, that's incredible. Uh, I'm not complaining in any way. Don't get me wrong. But those are the biggest ones that I've seen since 02. Yeah. And so, and then around here, they have had some 200 shot within like 15 miles. There's an area not too far away. Um, we had one on our property with short time that had 20 points, 21 points. He was shot as a four year old. He probably was 160, 165. Wow. You know, maybe he would have blown up, but he was almost the same as a three year old. So then you look at, well, he didn't, yeah. he didn't change three to four. Usually when you get that size, they're changing. We just don't see that. But man, some of those areas, like you mentioned, Kentucky, mm -hmm. uh, they showed me one down there that was a typical 193 that they said was three and a half year old. Jeez. Yeah. They had a it had a guy's name on it, that kind of buck. Like the oh, green yeah. buck. Yeah. Or yeah. Stuff like that. <laughs> I wonder if you see like um and you know, I do think that people are getting better at saying, Oh, that's a mature deer. Like they're finally getting to see what a five or six year old body looks like. The the hard part is just like in Illinois, like, you know, if you put a, a mid to high fifties three year old in Illinois past the guy, that's a tough deer to pass up for, for most oh, yeah. hunters. And so but if you put that same deer, same three-year-old by, by him that's 110 or 115 inches, I'm just wondering how much uh, we're at the point where we're high grading some of these deer populations that we're, you know. Yeah. We talk about that in Wisconsin. That's a, it's right next to a, a, a club and it's not, it's not a bad club. I'm a life <laughs> member there, but they, um, the point is that they have, they high grade a lot. So if they, yep. we have a buck right now, it's a, it's an eight point, but he's got really long main beams or sweeping real long G twos and threes, uh, really nice brow tines. And then he's got split G twos. And that's the type of buck as a three and a half year old that a lot of people in the area will shoot. And yeah. so we talk about all the time over there, our best bucks that we see like that one that I think is seven this year, he's a typical eight. Yeah. And that's why I think he made it. To that's why he made old. it through is yeah. People were yeah. okay with passing him versus if was he was, a clean 150 10 at three years old, they probably wouldn't have passed them. Yeah. And yeah. whereas around here, um, we're a little bit more fortunate. We don't have a lot of neighbors around the one couple sides. And then the other neighbors we have are, you know, those five, six year old uh, buck hunters, period. Yeah. And so, and we have about three of those neighbors around us, and one owns quite a bit of land in the area. So we're fortunate in that area. And then we have a, we have a property over here that's leased by a lot of the guys from the Matthews Matthews uh, mm. Archer, and that that property is like twenty. It's over two thousand acres, and it's uh that's about three quarters of a mile away. We don't get many bucks from there, but the point is, it's kind of that area where sure. there's a two thousand acre parcel, a nine hundred acre parcel, eleven hundred, fifteen hundred, seven hundred. We're one of the small ones in the area. Wow, we're kind of at the tip of all that, so we're not like in the middle of it, but it's still it's kind of cool to see. So we get to see uh, Pat Reeves shot a buck on that 2,000 acre piece uh, three years ago that I want to say was over 200. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I'm hopeful of, I, I'm again, I'm 
killing one's a whole different ball game. But if we could see a deer in the eighties on that new Illinois farm, at least we're in the game. I still, which is all I ask for I, every year. I don't, I still don't think we've like conceptualized that it could be possible. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it it's, it's there. The idea is there. Well, everybody, but until you see them, it's hard to like I believe. Mean, we hunt and manage. Yeah. We hunt and manage hard in a lot of different states. And the weird thing about out there is I'm not saying that it's easy, but you know, when you talk to these people and you're like, yeah, you know, we're, if we could grow like a five-year-old or they're, they're just like, well, yeah, you're going to see like multiple booners next year. And it's like, what do you yeah. mean? And it's just cause that's what's common out there. Yeah, it is. And it's the area. And then, um, that's why I say like best way to shoot a 200 inch buck is to move. Yep. Of course you have to be at that level to shoot them anyways, but um, meaning like your hunting strategy has to be at that level. But, um, you know, someone's 200 inches and other persons, I'm thinking like Gaylord, Michigan, where it's real sandy. If you shoot a six-year-old 140 inch, that's way that's a harder giant. there than shooting a 200 inch uh, in a lot of areas that I see where we, where we go see clients. I'm not yeah. kidding. It's because the 140 there is a, is a true ghost. It might be the biggest buck within 20 miles. Yeah, where that could be the biggest buck, you know, a 200 could be, there could be a 200 inch every mile or two yeah. in some of these locations. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or I couldn't, client, you know, 15 years in a row. So I couldn't even it's, it's, fathom seeing a four year old buck in Pennsylvania growing up, you know, let alone uh, there's plenty exactly. of deer that are, I mean, I've killed a five plus year old in the state. So, I mean, That's amazing. it's, it's weird to kind of, have those and it's also what's exciting about being able to hunt multiple states and have multiple properties is because my expectations in you know the mountains of kentucky are a heck of a lot different than they are on our farm in illinois um, well what's cool too is by hunting all these states and all these different types of properties it makes you a lot better hunter mm -hmm. it's kind of like you never leave your own your own little golf course you don't become a better golfer if you don't if you always catch bass in the same pond how good does it make you to go hunt them on the mississippi river or yeah. the big lake or yeah the great sure. lake. So, so it's kind of like when you get to move around you get to to me you get to hone in your skills a lot more and become a better hunter well i think that's why rising it, no and i know ben hates us putting him on a pedestal he's one of the best white-tailed deer hunters i've i've ever seen yeah oh yeah yeah if he's if he's on a big buck you know that dude will kill it already and he's a, yeah. he's freaking aggressive too yeah yeah, he is. Yeah. Yeah. He's, but he's, he gets on them, you know, yep. and it's kind of, um, but it's, uh, but again, it goes back to you, you, you got to be in those areas and you guys are in that area. And to me, like, if you guys weren't taking a couple five year olds at least off that property every single year, it'd be disappointing. Yeah, I would agree. Yep. So, and when if we don't, it'll just come down to time spent out there. Would yeah. Be I'm our sure they're going to be there. there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but a five-year-old over there, like to get a couple of those, they're not going to be one forty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that's that's right there. It's one seventy, one eighty plus. Yeah, as a five-year-old, where our five-year-olds here are one fifty-five, one sixty plus. Well, there's got to be junkers eight. everywhere. I mean, that, that one buck we call him Floppy. I mean, yeah, he's, get, he's for sure. I don't know, probably six or six seven or eight or something like yeah. that. And he and he's one forty. Yeah. you know, he's just a one. He's a eight point. He's an know? old bruiser. Oh, yeah. He, oh, I'd shoot the he, crap yeah, out of him he's for ready. sure. He's he's yeah. on the list for sure. Oh yeah. He's like me. I'm I'm the runt of my family. So <laughs> right. Yeah. We can't all have the yeah the jeans yeah. top jeans. Can't all be six three. It's coming. <laughs> yeah. No. No. I, I I do like your comment there, Jeff, about like hunting different areas and learning. I I'll show you the buck yeah. after the podcast here. But I mentioned I went to North Dakota and shot a really good one out there. Um, yeah. It was public land, and there's there's a lot of it out there. So I mean, it's it's primarily uh, public land out there, but man, I was like, I was out of my element with that, you know, to the point where, um, uh, there, there was a, a guy that w was kind of hosting us and, and he was really, uh, helpful in, in, uh, you know, showing us what to look for and even, you know, took us out to a few different spots he was familiar with. And, uh, I mean, a lot of that trip, at least the first part of it, I was really defaulting to him. I mean, it's not my first time reading buck sign, I've, you know, and I've been hunting my whole life, but out there, I was just looking to him so much to be like, I mean, I see what you're seeing. Like, well, how are you reading this though? Like yeah. what, what is the big picture? What yeah. is, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Well, and, that's what I think is cool is like, it's not just him telling you, this is what they do. It's you figuring out why they do what he's telling you they do. Mm -hmm. And once you learn the why, 
then you can apply it to anywhere in the country that's similar. Yeah, it was really awesome. He was he was a really good teacher in the aspect that like I actually killed that deer in the last 10 minutes of a whatever five or six day hunt. And, oh, awesome. and a lot of it, he was really coaching, really guided, you know, just, we did a lot of river miles and stuff. And on the very last one here, we went in and scouted these two different spots. And, uh, you know, I was right there with him. I saw the sign, you know, it was, it was primarily tracks, you know, cause it's so much like beaver dams and channels and islands. Oh, it's yeah. really like wilderness is Western North Dakota yeah. and, uh, not Eastern North Dakota. It's not like ag, you know, ag country by any means. And, uh, the deer's tracks is what killed that deer. Basically, we just, you know, there's a land bridge. We saw him going back into an island and, and he gave me the opportunity. Like we scouted these two different spots and he's like, he's like, what, which one do you think? You know, what do you, what do you think? And I'm like, you know, I'm la it's the kind of pressure's on. It's like the last one here. And like, it's, 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 uh, you know, me trying to figure out which one is the better spot paired with, you don't want to be selfish either. And like, you know, t take the better spot necessarily. So, but ultimately I, I was like, I think, you know, this first spot we looked at, I was like, I think that's, it's better sign. I was like, I think I have a better chance if on my last night here, if I'm going to kill him, that's probably where I need to go. And he, right. he knew the answer. Like he was like, yeah, that's where you need to go. And he's like, not only that, he's like, if that's where you're going to go, you need to push in there. Like, don't just set up on that land bridge and, and expect him to come out. He's like, you need to go in there and read the sign. And so where I ultimately ended up hanging the stand was maybe 200 250 yards back up into this you know the whole island's bedding area when we scouted it he's like don't he's like if we go on that island he's like we risk pushing everything off but when we decided to hunt it he's like you need to you need to go in it's your last it's yeah, your only hunt yeah, yeah. And which that, is so different if you were actually managing that private land as yeah a, as on all season oh for sure yep yeah it wouldn't be nearly as aggressive yeah so i learned i yeah, learned a lot on that trip that's the two styles. I always refer to the hunting public guys. I love those guys. And they, they're they in a state and they're super aggressive for a week and they move on. Yeah. And they can get more aggressive every single day because they're not going to be there next week. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's a different hunting style than, you know, the average person has that needs to manage their little honey hole on public land or their own private land for the entire season. Yeah. yeah. Can't afford to be that aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's where a lot of those guys in like in Iowa, like, um, uh, Rendo Eric and stuff yeah. and DeQuisto. Yeah. I mean, they'll just go bump and dump. And if it doesn't work out, they jump to the next farm. Meanwhile, it's like, man, if I blow my farm out, well, that's the, yeah. that's the appeal of public land and of, uh, you know, just like big, big access, you know, the more spots you yeah. can blow, you know, you can keep moving, keep going down the mm -hmm. line and, and it, they bounce back too. So it's like, not if you blow a spot once, like it's never good again, sure. you can circle back. You just have to have time and spots in between. Yep. That's a kind of like we look at even on our property here in, minnesota that's 255 let alone the 30 acres of cover we have in wisconsin now and it's if we mess up and we spook out the deer herd it's not like we can just go a half mile over and go hunt somewhere else like you can on public land or we're, we're done and so yeah. that's why a lot of people fail on private land is they're over aggressive and uh and you can ruin a month at a time and yeah. and then you do the same thing in a month when you hunt even if yeah. you did wait but you're not waiting you're going every weekend yeah or you're going every two weeks you do the same thing every time and it just sets, it makes your private land just uh, a nocturnal, uh, a nocturnal property for bucks. So mm. we were like the spot Jen went to last night. It was, we're waiting to use that water hole. LL Beams is on there. The flyer buck, I think was on there. We, we love that spot to potentially go hunt, mm -hmm. but we had to wait for easterly winds and um, you want to be a afternoon set. We go in the morning, we spook deer, we can get out in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, but even the place last year where Jeff and I both shot our bucks, it's a pretty intimate place. You know, it's all the way in the bottom. It's on the, we have good access because it's on the, one of the edges of our property, but it's through open timber. Yeah. Through all open timber, which is nice, but it's like, it's one of those really intimate spots where you have to wait for you yeah. know, the perfect time to go down there. Because if you don't, you could, you could totally ruin, you know, that part of the property, it, you know, and a lot of the other part of the property and then you can nothing's going to happen for a long time right and we blow out because we have big bedding areas that we've spent hours and hours cutting adjacent to it there's a water hole we fill there we put in a new road to get to it we've connected new roads in the bottoms with jen and i with the chainsaw and throwing logs to the side and jeff with a chainsaw i watch mm -hmm. yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, no, we don't let her have a chainsaw so i think she's it's called supervising jen 
right she's, she's yes. got like metal in her ankle and broken wrists and ankles from dirt bike riding so we don't let her do anything real aggressive i'm a good foreman she's gonna break something yeah. so, but anyways uh yeah that's that kind of spot that um it's if we spook that out we're spooking out 30 acres 40 acres of some of our best hunting area <laughs> in, in that portion of the property so we, we got to go in with northwest winds actually i shot my buck in the morning and jen shot hers in the afternoon yeah. so it's a morning or evening spot but but we have to have that heavy and heavy northwest winds better because we're hunting low so that means it spins up at a sure. up the drop so it comes over our left over shoulder in the morning or evening heavy and then it goes up the draw to the right or down low to the right depending on if it's morning or evening hmm. so we play that and then what we hunt is to our left so i think that's one thing i've really started to appreciate on our ohio farm is the farming activity that happens like man we really benefit from just the activity that's happening there like and, and also the pasture ground just the way that you know I, I think the deer will go in there but just they're they're not in there as as heavily as they will be for access yeah, for access and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So we really benefit. We can probably get away with a lot more vehicle traffic and stuff. I, I feel anyways, oh, yeah. because it's yeah, always yeah. happening anyways. Like they, they don't know, they don't know that I'm wearing camo or that I'm going to get up in that tree stand. No. So, you know, that's why roads, like even roads around the property. Yeah. I have clients. So like one client I can think of, he was a half mile in, he had a 40 acre parcel surrounded by woods and then ag land. And it was a cool parcel. There's a lot of big bucks that went through that, but he couldn't get out there without spooking deer day or night, morning, evening, didn't really matter. Yeah. Cause he had to walk through so much cover to get there where yep. if you have roads on a couple sides, you can just pop off the road and hunt. You're 40 yards in hunting a mature box bedding area. He's none the wiser. Cause you just walk down the road to get in there where he's used to a bunch of traffic. So yeah. I've got, um, that new, so I expanded my Southern Ohio farm to from 130 to 230 acres, um, just There's recently. Huge. And so I've got, um, I've got logging crews going in there in the next two, three weeks, which kind of sucks from a hunting side, but from a long-term beneficial side, cutting a bunch oh, yeah. of timber and, um, putting in roads as well for access through there as part oh, of my timber awesome. contract. Yeah. That's so. great. Mm -hmm. That'll be, it'll be worth it. Yeah. I'd, I'd rather have them do it in December, January, but you know what I've, when that's, what we run do with clients, clients will say, well, I really want them to come in in January. I'm kind of like, you you just need to get it cut. Yeah. When when they cut, we had just real quick. We have a rattlesnake country, uh, not too far around where we're at here, and in, in southwest Wisconsin. Jen loves rattlesnakes, right? Yeah. <laughs> she, <laughs> she seems so but, thrilled um, about it. <laughs> had a client that he was waiting for his timber to be cut. They weren't going to come in until November, December. He was down in that southwest Wisconsin area. Loggers called him up in in August and late August said we're going to come over now and he said oh that's awesome you know what's going on and he said well the current job had so many rattlesnakes on it wow. and it was really hot all they kept running into he's like we're gonna we're gonna shift over to yours so he got his cut early he was so happy yeah um, but uh, anyways yeah we, yeah I'm just yeah, gonna. Oh, snake point we stay away from that i think it'll be it'll be interesting because they they hand cut everything and then they skid it out um really yeah so everything will get hand cut and i mean it's a, we're talking between the three parcels they're going to cut almost five hundred thousand board feet so a half a million board feet out of there um and then they'll skid it out and uh but it'll be interesting to see how how quick deer funnel back in for all those fresh tops drop in and um when are they finishing uh probably so they'll it's three parcels they'll move through it'll probably all be done right before the end of november yeah i would boy and your season goes till when february february in southern ohio yeah yeah so they might really come in and end of december <laughs> yeah, yeah log the browse. Like that on the it took um i would say they were done in october and the deer started coming back in december yep that sounds november. right but part of it was too. imagine there, they started in July and they ended in October and uh, the deer just went somewhere else for fall. I yep. mean, they had completely established a completely different fall range. Yep. And, uh, and so it took a while for them to come back at that point, but sounds yep. like yours will be fairly fast. Yeah. And I've got some areas of the property that aren't getting timbered at all. Um, so, you know, I've got some kind of corners and back corners that I can get into that, you know, there'll be no logging activity within you know, three quarters of a mile from there. Um, right. so, but yeah, it'll, again, I'm thinking more long-term and it was classic. Uh, it, it looked pretty right. Big white oaks and stuff, but you know, from a deer habitat standpoint, it was junk, you know, hundreds of acres of, of wasted area basically. Um, mm -hmm. 
So yeah, we 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 cut pretty hard. We cut some select. Uh, I've got three areas that are two two acres, four acres, and four acres of complete clear cut. Um, that'll be oh, nice. that'll be just you know centralized giant bedding browse areas. You adding any conifer to those areas? Say that or again. You need conifer. Are you adding any conifer? Um, I might. Yeah, so it doesn't need. It doesn't, it doesn't really, in fact, the two of those areas that I'm cutting were all, uh, red pine, like on, on oh, bluffs yeah. and stuff. Um, you know, so not a ton of timber value, but it, it also was like, you know, they were 30 foot tall. So they're biological desert underneath it. Oh, yeah. So just cut those areas out, let it grow up thick around there. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, you know, yeah. it's far enough South in, in that area, Jeff, that I don't know. I mean, it wouldn't hurt to have some thermal and they do, they still will have some areas, but. You know, it's probably not super critical. Well, and it's it's so different when it's in hill country too. But I yes. like um, I like the the conifers just for screening. So when you look yep. across the wood, you have these pockets where deer can never see past. Yep, absolutely. So instead of having an open hollow, because you go to some of the hollows around here and it's eighty acres, and I've been there in the winter time, and you can literally stand see on straight across almost every square inch with a little snow on the ground. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it'll look thick. It'll it some parts of that. Um, I just started getting into because i just bought it and uh it's it's thick already and but i might try to get in there before they really cut to to kill something so and you guys had some projects going on <laughs> you and too many months. oh here <laughs> just I, I know you guys gotta go to lunch here i want to share this with you real quick because we talked a lot about it early on do you remember me telling you on that ohio farm i had all this wasted pasture acreage and we were yeah. going back and forth i was like what do we do do we burn it off do we plant switchgrass yeah we ended up burning it um, so we went in in October uh, of last year and sprayed, uh, I sprayed all of it. Reason for waiting to October was all the broadleafs at that point were pretty much dormant, and it just looked yeah. like a big, uh, you know, fescue, fescue you know, uh, yeah. grass fields. Went out and sprayed it all with uh, uh, t two acres of gly on everything, and then went back in late February of this past year and burned it all off. It was like twenty or twenty five acres. And oh, wow. then we went back like a week or two later and turned it all over, just dissed it. And oh, really? a lot of it right now is five or six foot tall, five or six That's foot tall. Awesome. Just like, I don't know what it is. It's combinations of all, you know, each. Well, I, yeah. You don't really care. It's I don't like whatever, especially when it's a higher percentage of broadly. Yeah. Yeah. So we killed most it's of the fescue out. I mean, there's some that kind of came back, but it looks kind of th okay. thickety for the yeah. first year. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It's probably a lot of diversity in there. Yeah, yeah and then it is. and then in that kind of area, I use switch grass for screening, for edge cover, for consistent thick pockets. But even that, that's forty percent, thirty percent, something like that of the entire area. Yeah, that'll be so a big thing that we add in Illinois. Is, is obviously on the edge for screening, but within those large CRP fields, some irregular shape type switch grass pockets for edge. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just fun to plan out too, and and then down there, if you really practice a lot of pre weed control, then um, you can get that switchgrass to be five feet tall uh, at least by the end of the year, and so the end of the growing season, so you can actually have really good cover going into next hunting season. So it's not something you need to wait two or three years. Yeah, that that um, that's the other thing. Even with your Ohio, the the soil quality down there is it it's crazy. Uh, I mean, CRP oh, payments yeah. are over three hundred dollars an acre oh my gosh yeah, yeah. that's crazy well yeah. if we could just get well, our going, weed control to yeah. happen we can have some pretty killer food plots this year was kind of a it yeah. happened late we didn't like you said we didn't close on the farm till we didn't get it under contract till yeah. august august mm -hmm. so. oh wow that's that growing season is so nice there yeah it well that's what all those crops are coming off and immediately behind it you know they're coming in with winter wheat and the bean fields and stuff they're double cropping um you know, so yeah, it'll be interesting. We'll keep you posted on it, but, um, well, Hey, we, yeah, we appreciate, appreciate we appreciate you guys coming on. We know you got to get West to lunch. Otherwise he'll be grumpy on his birthday and you don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, no. But yeah, keep us, we'll, we'll obviously be following along with the, the video journey and stuff here through the fall, but yeah. yeah, hard to believe this is dropping on, on October 24th. Good chance. All four of us are in a tree stand this morning. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah very Thank possible. You guys. Always, yes, always great uh, having a conversation with you. No, we, we appreciate the time and, um, yeah, enjoy the videos. And, and obviously, you know, uh, looks like the seed company is doing really well. And, um, 
it's exciting yeah. to see that stuff continue to to grow outside of your brand obviously yeah we have a couple more products we hopefully we can launch before next spring too so we'll we'll keep tight on that before we do <laughs> so do, do you want to give us just a real a real quick uh spiel like i know people know where to find you at white tail habitat you guys are still doing classes too right mm-hmm. yeah we have the web classes and then uh going to clients we have wes dylan joe and kevin that go to client uh yep. clients too so as a company we'll go to over 300 again next year wow and a lot of our schedules are already you know half booked or more so jesse schedules all those and then um but really we're putting out four videos a week on youtube <laughs> And then also, um, I put out, I started putting out shorts, you know, so far that's been every other day. We don't put out a YouTube video. I put out a YouTube short Mm -hmm. and then I'm very active on Instagram too. Um, Jen and Wes field all our food plot questions, Uh, any questions we have food plot related mostly, or a little bit habitat go through Jesse. She gets everything. And then she funnels them through, uh, to Jen or Wes. We try to respond to every email we get through the company. And, uh, and then of course we have the books and, uh, seed company is WS, uh, pure wildlife blends. So that's, uh, easy to find too, right mm-hmm. off our main site. And, but, uh, yeah, very cool. try to stay consistent, but it's, we're, it's getting, uh, busy kind of, a, mm-hmm. a larger animal to control sometimes. I was going to say busy, busy out of client season and into hunting season, basically. Yeah. Definitely. We still like Dylan was over two days ago and we shot five videos and then went and hit the stand mm-hmm. so, and then yeah, we actually had a really nice set um but yeah we shoot we'll shoot next week uh shoot the following week he'll come out for uh pennsylvania so that'll be a time where we shoot videos while we're hunting in pennsylvania so we usually take the time to shoot one or two in the morning one or two in the afternoon while we're out in the field awesome um, but yeah it kind of never stops and Jen's pretty active on her Instagram page. And if you guys want to look up her Instagram page, um, she had a, a pretty nice clip of her uh, chasing down a grouse. She shot with a bow the other day. Literally, I, I saw I'm it. watching the grouse fly, I... fly away with her arrow. And then uh, and then I pan back to Jen because I'm paying attention to the grouse. And here she's running down the, the gravel road to go get her grouse. So that's nice funny. Shot, but... <laughs> was that was that in Minnesota or was that in Canada? That was Canada. in Canada. We I go thought up, so. Uh, we, we had the bows because we bring them for target practice. We did that for the last couple of years. And then last year, like when we're up there, we see so many grouse. We're like, well, let's just let's go buy some tags and go grouse hunt with the bows. And we've had so much fun. And, oh, I uh, bet. And so we did it again this year. And we had enough for, for uh, you know, have a meal of grouse uh, a yeah. couple of times. Mm-hmm. That's pretty impressive. Too, so. yeah. yeah, it was they just kind of stay in there. It's more about the stealthy approach of actually getting out of the vehicle, putting an arrow on the bow and using some brush to screen you a little bit and get a shot. But it's, it hones your bow hunting skills. Let's put it sure that does. a little bit. <laughs> Pretty cool. It gives us some life. So right on. awesome. Well, yeah, guys, we appreciate you coming on. And I know a lot of people watch the content you guys are putting out and, and really enjoy it. Well, and, we really you know, it. yeah, we really appreciate it. All right. Good. Yeah, we'll see you guys. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Oh, dude, it's almost fall. You and I are both going to be in a tree stand with brand new Hoyt bows. We're going to be shooting the RX-7 carbon bow this year. I know Hoyt's also got the Venoms out, both equally smooth shooting, quiet bows. Heck yeah, man. And we got a convert on our hands this year. We got a lifelong crossbow guy with a vertical bow in his hands for maybe the first time ever, a good friend of mine. And uh, we've got them all decked out with uh, the inline accessories uh, from the QAD integrated ultra rest uh, to the quiver. And also he's got the SL sidebar mount with a couple of stabilizers from Hoyt as well. So that's going to be a six shooting bow. Yeah. And Hoyt's been cool enough that anyone listening to this can save 20% on any of the soft good apparels online using the code Hunter, H-U-N-T-R, no E. Uh, and if you want to look at the latest lineup of Hoyt bows, check out your local Hoyt dealer. Get serious, get Hoyt. Awesome to have Jeff and Jen on. Um, yeah, to your point, got me fired up about the Illinois farm. Mm. Makes me think that at any moment, it's possible Giants mm. going to show mm-hmm. up. I, you know what? I would go, like, as we consider, because it's, it's probably one of the two, right? It's either that week uh, week of Halloween or, like, the second week before mm-hmm. Kansas with a quick turnaround or something like that. Yeah, that'd be tough. Yeah. 
yeah. So, but I, I mean, I would go out just for a floppy if that's all we had. Sure. No, I think, um, I would assume something else is going to show here. I'd be stoked with that. I mean, first year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, it's as much as I don't even know, you know, we need to post it because we own it now. Uh, check the food plots, um, potentially move cameras on the scrapes or something. If like, oh, there's a giant scrape and For our sure. cameras just over here. Just need to get out there. Yeah, just need to get out there. Uh, really to make our presence known because we've had a few uh, visuals of trespassers on there yeah. already. So, um, but yeah, I, I would expect in the next two weeks, it's going to get pretty, pretty bumping out there. So I'm ready. I'm ready yeah, rock. me too. But um yeah, so if you're listening to this, October 24th, um, Jeff and Jen stopped in to, to talk to us. I mean, we're we're in it at this point. This this next week is awesome. You know what? I'm going to go out on a limb and say, good chance is my first year ever of killing more than one buck in a season. I've never done that. Oh. Uh, yeah, Which is hard to believe. Really good I've chance. shot at more than one buck in a season well, before. Well, yes. <laughs> but I've never actually killed more than one buck in a season. I'll, I've never killed more than Be like two. Like a real outdoor industry guy. Yeah. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> almost. No, yeah. Yeah, almost. Mm-hmm. You have to tag a bunch of sponsors in your post. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sorry. Right, right, right. You didn't qualify. Right, 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 right. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, no, I would say there's a really good chance of that. I mean, considering we've you've got Ohio, we've got Illinois, and we've got Kansas. Yeah. All coming. I just need one out of three to pan out, and I'll I'll achieve that goal. Well, it'll be fun. We, uh, the Illinois thing will be cool. You know, first season on our, our property we own together. Uh, Kansas is always fun. Deer camp. You know, yeah. looking uh, forward to that regardless we'll of what in, we get into. Yeah, there. we'll have a good a good time down there, and um, yeah, then back in the home front, just you know, try to make something happen here over the next couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I have like, I don't know, five buck tags or something. Yeah, Dang. yeah, or more. A lot of <laughs> lot, lot of good information. I mean, it's it's I mean, it's not at all the same conversation, but like you know, Sturgis hasn't necessarily changed his like. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he's got a process that works and it's like over time we've kind of, I think, figured out how it applies to our property and like makes sense. And like, cause we're hunting very sure. different properties in some sense. The Illinois one is, it's cool. Cause we'll be able to do that together. But, mm-hmm. um, the, do- the, like the dove factory thing, the summer food thing, like kind of starts to make more sense. And as I make mistakes and do, you know, make changes on my own property, it's like, okay, I see why this is happening. Mm-hmm. I get it. I get it. So basically what I took away from that is we need to shoot a bunch of does. Like the clovers, I think good in the meantime, I can yeah. at least sustain some food plots. We need to shoot, uh, we I need to shoot that's, 20 to 30 does. I probably. mean, first of all, that's not an easy task. No, I know. Do you want to come out? You want to? Yeah, I'll shoot does. You come out, you bring yeah. kids. Shoot does. And then number two is like, how do you, unless you do it in a late season, how do you do it without pressuring? I know. I don't know if you can. I mean, I think that's... In the summer is the way to do it. I mean, Or areas where you're like, there is no buck I want to hunt over here. I can slam a bunch of does. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple, and there are bucks in the area, but like, you know, Rays, East Twin, like, you know, there's areas where it's like, it's, they're easy. Like, they're going to be there. It's funny. I saw like uh, Warren and David shot like three and four does each, like from the tree stand in the morning. Yeah. Like just boom, 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 hammer I them out. Sh- I could have shot 11 of them the other day. <laughs> well, granted, they would have run, but... Yeah, I mean, I don't know. There Maybe. was a there was a pile. That of that is the kind of thing that that starts to slowly creep up of like, you know, how many do you shoot? And yes, we probably should shoot a bunch of them. I mean, I legitimately think between the Hall Hinton and the Roberts, uh, probably twenty or thirty is <laughs> is necessary. Neither. There's that you'll you'll see that many in a in a food plot. And your dad needs to rent us a cooler truck. Yeah, yeah, I've been thinking about that, like doing a. Bit like cutting off a corner of the the barn and doing some kind of an insulated uh, cooler, because yeah, I mean you shoot five six does between. I'll cu- look at couple um, guys. I'll, I'll get you information on this hunt shed thing. It's pretty cool. It it would work out well. It, you could leave it up for the season. Okay. And then break it down off the season and pack it away. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be it'd be a cool. That's thing a company that's gonna work with you. Yeah, I've I've got some connections to them. They're just coming through with some stuff. They're modifying some things. So. Because I have a, a walk-in building with an air conditioner with the old restrictor plate off. In Ohio, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but other than that, I don't have shit. And I'd like to because yeah. otherwise I'm processing like that day when it's yeah, hot. We need one at the farm. It just makes It does make sense not to have one. Yep. So, 
Well, cool. Well, we appreciate Jen and Jeff showing up and uh, talking to us a little bit about October hunting. And man, it's October 24th or later. You best be getting in the woods at this point. And that's all I got. That's where I'll be. All right. We'll see you next week. Later. It's taking me. Oh.